listening to the Getting Salty Experience podcast. And away we go. You remember that guy? The news guy? Lloyd Lindsay Young? Hey, yeah, yeah. Lloyd Lindsay Young. Channel 5. Yeah. Was it 5? I no. don't know. Anyway, we're back. I think, I think we're back at the five. Firehouse Kitchen. T- it was uh, Channel 9, Lloyd Lindsay Young. Oh, Lloyd Lindsay Young. Yeah, yeah. Nice. Yep. I think they had a missing chromosome, but uh, not, uh, <laughs> we are back at the firehouse kitchen table. Welcome back to another episode. We got Ruffy Roof. What with, up? Uh, what hat you got on today, fella? I got my Ducks Unlimited. Oh, very nice. We, oh, I just looked up. I just realized that. Thank God Pete changed his. He had on. Wow. I don't know what it was. We were going to have what a we raffle. call Green's Tiger Stripe in the, in the game, sir. Green tiger, <laughs> green tiger stripe. It was a hoodie. It was a hoodie. What? Just the facts, ma'am. Just the facts. Gotcha. Just the facts, ma'am. We were gonna have a raffle and give that thing away at the end of the wow. show. It was so heinous. Buy another one and throw them both out. Yeah. <laughs> so I got man. my second shot today, bro. Got the second shot. How you feeling? How you feeling? feeling good. Look, limba. Yep. Not going on. I'm limba. Limba. I'm not yep. limber. I'm anything so, uh, but. I'm sore as hell. For I that think I, how long you got to wait now until you're fully vaccinated? A month. I don't know, a couple, uh, couple weeks. Two couple weeks, weeks. 15 days, something. Because uh, on the way out, I said to the kid on the way out, I said, now I'm going to go to the supermarket and lick all the fruit. How you like that? <laughs> <laughs> you're not going to really do that. I'm like, nah, just kidding. Felicia and I were, uh, <laughs> Felicia and I were debating because – we were advised to take the vaccine, but after after we got clear of antibodies, because we were all sick in December. So we got six months of waiting. Um, but uh, so you feel comfortable. You're good. You're happy you took the oh, vaccine. Oh, yeah, bro. Absolutely. Yeah. All good. All yeah. right. All right. We'll probably. What about this uh, third bowl that I grew down here? But other than that, <laughs> I'm feeling all right. <laughs> try <laughs> big. I got try big. <laughs> Which so one did you get? Which one did you get? Pfizer. Pfizer. Yep. Ooh. Ooh, they got the Pfizer. Ooh. All right, so listen, we got a guy on tonight. Really never worked anywhere. Never <laughs> saw no fire. His father wasn't a legend. So. <laughs> I think who that's also, why we got him on, right, Coops? Yeah, I mean, yeah, that's yeah. Really... Who also has absolutely no resume. And uh, this uh, contestant, uh, really never did any of this to get anywhere or never had one of these <laughs> to get where he went. So how do you beat that that hype up right there, right? Like so we got to get now. We got a really hot shot tonight. My man, probably three quarters of the chat knows already who he is. Billy Carlson. <laughs> there, go. Uh, there he is. What's going on? I thought you were going to wear a hat. On? Yeah, what happened to your hat? I got the hat. I'll I'll put the hat on and take it off. And, oh, uh, all right. I so don't want to blind anybody. My, my wife, my wife told me she goes, "You know what day it is, right?" I go, "It's April 1st. And I go, "Oh shit, April Fool's Day." <laughs> I go, "I guarantee what they're gonna do. They're gonna announce me and go, hey, Billy, April Fool's.'" Damn, this kid's going to go blank, and Eric Weiner from 111 is going to be <laughs> Never heard of him. Who is he? <laughs> Who's that? Um, oh, shit. So, Very nice. I, oh, I was, and, and Louie, I told you I was a little nervous, and uh, I walked around the neighborhood today, Naked. and I felt like, well, no, I had clothes on, but I felt like George Munch before he'd go on Brooklyn Radio on any given 4th of July night in the 1980s. Just ready for the ba- like, just ready for it. Right. right. It's coming. Rocking and rolling. And uh people, you know, guys used to look forward to listening to him on the radio on Fourth of July night in Brooklyn. No doubt. It was it's absolutely amazing. Amazing. All right, but so, before we get into the stories, Pete, why don't you give us a little shameless plug? Of course. Ladies and but gentlemen, of course. you guys but all of know course. we're brought to you by GettingSaltyApparel.com, guys. GettingSaltyApparel.com, where you will find the coolest firefighter apparel in the game. That's Ooh. right. And the accessories like uh, this fine, fine Ooh. drinking vessel right here. Uh, you know, shot glasses, lighters, cigar cutters, all that sort of stuff. If you guys want to support us and support the show, head on over to GettingSaltyApparel.com and uh, grow. Uh, don't cramp up. Oh, don't cramp up. Listen, don't cram up when it comes to the super chat either. You know, give a little sunlight. Give a little <laughs> hey, yeah, that's the other way we make a little bit of. Uh, give a little peck. Give us a peck. 
If oh, you guys, lucky strike. If you guys, if you guys, if you guys absolutely have to smoke the best cigarette in the game, smoke a lucky strike. No, no. Uh, if you guys absolutely uh, have to have a question that I gets through, that you guys are welcome to use the super chat. Oh, wow. And already banging it out here, Darren Phillips. Thank you, brother. And that's uh, coming all the way from Vancouver, Canada, where I have. He's up. These guys are crazy. Thanks, bro. We you appreciate it, man. We do. Up. And that's What's it, guys. That's what's, all the, you got? Uh, what's the word of the day there, Kobe Coops? We got the I, word of the day. I, you didn't let me spit it out. You I know, but I feel right, all over, jump right all over it. I jump on it. I'll I take it, that. Grenade. Uh, why do you take it? Good. Hey, Pete, what's the, what's the word of the day, Pete? <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, the word of the day is JMO. I never picked that one, huh? Oh. Well, that's. Cheers to J-Mo. <laughs> Woo! Love I've, got, I've got some non-J-Mo. I got, uh, I got this stuff still from Vermont that I've been drinking. It's pretty good. It's pretty good. Some maple. Oh, I saw that. That's the one where you get the uh, pair of pink candies with it, right? Yeah. It turns it, it turns into a hairy lip. Used. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It does turn you into a hairy lip. Hey, hey, <laughs> that's organic, right? That's yeah. organic. One hundred percent organic. Hey, hey listen, buy this. What is, what is that? What is anyway? Bourbon? What is it? <laughs> yeah, good. Yeah, it's a good bourbon. It's got. It's oh. from a maple cask, and it's. You don't have to sell hey. nobody. You don't it's have a distillery. No, I'm just saying. Yeah. It's a distillery right A box right there. of Kotex <laughs> and lipstick oh. comes with it. <laughs> oh, no, no. You got to oh, leave. No, no. No, no. No, no. A no, no. little went a little too far. <laughs> Put them up. Put them up. Oh, my oh, God. Oh, my God. God. All right. Let's stop the shenanigans. We got to dive. Yeah. Billy has a really short, shitty resume here <laughs> that's about a mile long. So let's get right into it. Bill. Of course, we know why uh, you got on the job, right? Your dad was a fireman, legend fireman. Well, um, and absolutely, I no doubt got on the fire department, following my father's footsteps. Um, very interesting how my father got introduced to the uh, to the FDNY. Uh, my dad grew up in um, Maspeth, uh, right on the other side of the BQE from Rescue Force quarters, and my grandfather, who was a cab driver, and um, a Broadway musician. He had pigeons. And you know how, like, you know, it was a big thing all over the city. You have pigeons. Yeah, fly the pigeons. Yeah. So um, I guess a guy in Rescue 4 had pigeons on the roof of the firehouse on Queens Boulevard. Oh, shit. One, and they all had, they all have, like, little Certain tags. bands. They have their certain right. bands for that, for that so crew. one of these guys' pigeons gets uh, caught up with my grandfather's pigeons, and oh, my shit. grandfather realizes it. So he goes over. To rescue for his quarters and my father was probably eight years old and he goes with them and uh they go up to the roof and uh, my grandfather gives the guy back the pigeon and they're up there bullshitting for a while and uh, about pigeons my, my father's just looking around and um a run comes in and this firefighter grabs my father runs him down to the top floor of rescue for his quarters they slide the pole to the second floor Slide the pole to the first floor, and my father watches Rescue Four turn out on Queens Boulevard. Wow! <laughs> and that was it. That was it. He was he was, he was sold from from yeah. there on in. And uh, you know, and then he actually, Pete, do you have the picture of my father uh, with his makeshift fire truck as a kid? I sure do. I sure do. Stand by. No, you know, my whole family was into pigeons in Brooklyn and that that, well, that was a common thing they all the birds in your your birds would have a certain band and you would try and steal the other like they, the birds would fly and mix into each other and you would try and get the other guy's birds and that that was like part of the the fun of the whole thing you know, wow. it, was oh, great. Yeah. you know it was really good so like the guy if you live next door to that guy and his pigeon shit all over your house <laughs> and your car, you're like wow that's great i love the love uh, living next to the pigeon coop yeah, guy, the pigeon guy. You know, that, yeah. all over your laundry right. when it's yeah, drying yeah. Nice. no because they're, they're not flying around his house they're flying around his neighbor's house <laughs> shitting on their house and then they land back on his roof right oh my god so <laughs> if you look at this picture there's my father and my uncle eddie and my dad's makeshift fire truck. There's a Dietz lantern. There's another little lantern, and there is a 274, the um, a mask, a, uh, you know, the, the face piece from the old Scott bottles. And, wow. uh, I guess you, know, you guys grew up in Whitestone. It's a 274. Well, my father actually um, he moved to um, 
uh, Whitestone. You know, they bought a house in Flushing, actually. And um, when he was in grammar school, now St. Michael's Parish was, Louis, you might be able to help me out with this. Was it um, by right next to 273 or 274? I think it's next to 274. All right. But my, um, so my father was a kid in grammar school and in the, in like the spring and the fall, the windows of the school would be open and the firehouse windows would be open and my father could count the bells and like know if there was a second (laughs) alarm somewhere. I mean, he's like 10 years old and he's, he's counting the bells, you know, in in the firehouse from, you know, and the nuns are going around. Howie. What are you it was doing? always in his blood, huh? Always. It was always beginning. in his blood. It was always in his blood. So my father went to um, Bishop Lachlan High School, which was in um, like Brooklyn, like uh, you know, right uh, right by Rescue Two Two Ten Engine, and um, he he was very good friends with a uh, a lieutenant there, a guy uh, Richard Hamilton, who was an absolute legend on the job. Um, you know, um, he was a uh, on the side, he you know he had heavy equipment operator, and um, he told my father he, he he met Richard Hamilton and my father met when my father used to hang out at Rescue Four when I was a kid. So now Richard Hamilton's a lieutenant in Rescue Two. My father's going to Bishop Lachlan High School right down the block. So Dick Hamilton goes, Howie, just live in the firehouse, and that's what he did. He lived. Come in on. Waters. Like you know, like 1961 through 1964. Come on, yeah, oh yeah, dude, that's crazy. And he would, he had a camera, and he would, you know, take pictures. And the the one thing Dick Hamilton said was, Howie, you can't ride until you have all your homework done. And then he would ride on the rigs, and they're going to jobs all over the place. So um, my father took a lot of pictures. And he'd send it, I guess, uh, the D- the Daily Mirror was a paperback then, uh, the Long Island Press. And he, what he would do, he was taking so many photos and he didn't want, you know, I guess people to start to get the heads up if all these photos were by Howie Carlson, how he's getting to all these fires. But he wanted the public to know what the, how great the FDNY was. So he'd take pictures, he'd take the film, give it to one of his uh, classmates and go, yeah, go, go to the Daily Mirror. Tell them you took the pictures just to, you know, and then get the money, whatever the money they're going to give you, take it, and just to get the FDNY exposed. Wow. And um, now, Pete, I have photos that he took from uh, a job on Franklin Avenue. Oh, I got you. I got you. Uh, Franklin right and Myrtle here. underneath <laughs> the L. And, um, I mean, this is wow. rescue two. This is underneath the elevated train structure. And this is, I believe, 1990, uh, 1961. Look at a guy standing on the railing next to the ladder, the fireman. Yep. I, I, I just look how calm they all are, Louis. Uh huh. I mean, it's just, uh, you know, and just, you know, you can go through those photos, the whole sequence. Dude, uh, that's a lot of people, man. Oh, that's you, a you lot know, of people, cool. man. Yeah, I mean, the whole fire escape. and the guys from rescue are just so calm, like. How many we people got are this. on that fucking fire escape? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, maybe nine, ten, and, eleven, and, and, twelve people. And and the fire was in a uh, John's Bargain store. I guess they were a chain back in the day over there. And uh, just uh, if you want to scroll through, uh, Pete, and show the yep. rest of the whole sequence. Here's the other there. one. So so Ooh, more yep. of the same. Yeah, you've seen him putting a ladder up there to, to help and, him get and down. And you can actually see in this photo the L structure, the L tie. Was oh, yeah, Amber. right on the top they there. Yeah, they had an L, and uh, you know, you talk to guys; they said it was like sunlight did not hit Myrtle Avenue because of that L. Wow. Oh. Yeah, no doubt. Look at this one. Well, that's a pretty nasty smoke up there too, man. Oh yeah. yeah. You making a grab here? It looks like they are. That's the grab, oh, they, baby. Oh, they, they pulled them all down, and that guy at the top of that ladder is as calm as can be. Look at him. He's got a smile on his face almost. <laughs> oh, <holy laughs> smokes. <laughs> I got one more here. There you go. Yeah. There you oh, go. what got do we got there? A little, oh, peak, little, 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 shot, yeah, little oh, leg. All right. <laughs> I, knew, I knew Kev would get excited right away. There you go. Filthy animal. Nice. Dirty animal. Oh. Who's out on the top? Oh. Is that J-Mo on the top? 
Great picks, dude. How old was he when he took he's taking these pictures? Uh, he was in high school. He was no in high shit. school. All these pictures. And I really, I mean, I've seen a lot of fire photos. I just love those photos. I mean, there's so much going on in those pictures. And, uh, you know, yeah, and man, that's really my father was, was sending photos into the newspapers on a regular basis, showing the public what the FDNY wow. did. So you know? how, how did he end up getting... I mean, he obviously took the test. How did he end up uh, getting on the job? How old was he? Oh, well, he had a whole, you know, before he was a fire dispatcher. Uh, uh, actually, he was in the fire patrol, 1965, 66. Huh. He, gets, uh, he gets on the uh, fire dispatchers, I believe, like 67. And um, hmm. he was working the night. That Martin Luther King was assassinated, and that was April fourth, nineteen sixty-eight. And uh, uh, Herb Eyes, who I talked to last night, mentioned that my father was on the radio, and they had two fifth alarms going at the same time on Seventh Avenue, one at one hundred and tenth Street and one at one hundred twenty-fifth Street, and uh, they were going to pull. My father off the radio was he was a young dispatcher and John T. O'Hagan, who at the time was fire commissioner and chief of the department, said, nah, we leave, leave, leave the kid on. He's doing a good job. And leave then, the kid on. Yeah, and, <laughs> How we call and him. Then, leave the kid on. <laughs> but he he hears um there's a, a unit from like lower Manhattan was relocated up to Harlem. And um uh, you hear um uh, they give a 1075 for a box. And O'Hagan goes to my father, don't transmit that 1075. They're from like downtown. They don't see a lot of fire. And my father's like, what? And then like the second section of 26 truck pulls up and goes, do we got a 1075 coming in here? And then O'Hagan goes, now you can transmit the uh, 1075. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I like it. I like but, it. for the trade. But my, you know, my father was so between – Rescue Four and in Riding and Rescue Two um, was just you know I mean he he knew he wanted to be a firefighter um, so my my parents get married and my um, my father had to go by Carlton Avenue and Rescue Two's quarters one night and uh, my mom is five months pregnant with me and they're hanging out now back in the back in those days. Rescue 2 didn't go to East New York until the third along. So my father and my mom are in Rescue 2's quarters on Carlton Avenue, and they bang out like a third along in two minutes out on Sutter Avenue somewhere uh, in East New York. So my father goes, Jane, let's go. Brings her on the rig. And she's going in with my father. They're going into this third along. So technically, my first run in the fire department, <laughs> on a fire truck. I wasn't even born yet. You were already buffing. <laughs> Can this guy get any more buffing. fire department in his blood, bro? Oh, my God. Like, <laughs> my God. He forgot and, uh, to tell you they hit a bump, and his mother gave birth to him on the back of the rescue <laughs> break. And, <laughs> Holy shit. You know, so... Uh, Wait, you got uh, a picture? Pete, Does Peter have a picture of your mom in there? Please, please show that picture. Yeah, I because, do. Uh, I do. Hold on. Very here. beautiful lady. Hold on. Look at it. And that is my wonderful mom. And uh, she uh, was just so close to so many firefighters, you know, you know, that, you know, part of the family was the fire department is a family and myself, my father and me, we, we put her, we, we really did. Uh, we tortured her with the fire department. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> we get the, um, like we'd be sitting down having dinner and the scanner would be on. And you hear like, you know, we lived in um, Richmond, Queens, and you'd hear like a 9,600 box come in and we'd be eating. And my mom would be telling a story and you'd hear, shish. And she oh. just, um, but uh, <laughs> you, all right, I might as well bring it up now since we're talking about buffing and all that. Three, two in the Carlson's. <laughs> and you know what that is. And we're the way that in. came up. Well, that way that came about, and my poor mom also. So 
in my house in Richmond Hill, an old Victorian <sighs> house, going to call the, the phone was on my mom's side of the bed. And uh, my father, every night, would call Warren Fuchs, who was a Brooklyn dispatcher, go, hey, Warren, put, you know, anything, anything comes in, give me a call. So this happened all the time when I was in high school. You know, the phone would ring at like 3.30 in the morning. <laughs> I don't like, believe poor it. Mom, Holy shit. I don't grab believe the phone, it. Jesus. Grab the phone and go, hold on, Warren. Howie, it's Warren. <laughs> Hand the phone over to her. <laughs> to my father. No. And, I... uh, and next thing you know, he'd be like, Warren, be like, uh, Howie, you got like a fourth alarm going on, uh, you know, um, down in Sutter Avenue somewhere. And, you know, all right, Warren, I'm going. He'd hang the phone up. He'd run in, wake me up. I'm in high school. It's 3 o'clock in the morning. Come on, Billy, we're going to a jump. We get, we had a big station wagon with paneling on the side. Love it. it the family side, truck stuff. His, his side <laughs> job was cleaning. he was a spray, he was a spray painter on the side. So he had all the painting equipment in there and everything. And we'd get in the car and we'd drive. We'd get on that Interboro Parkway at Myrtle Avenue and 80th Street. Wow. That entrance there. And you could, we were up on a hill. So you could see the plume of smoke. I mean, this was my grown up. This was like, you know, once a week, you know, you know, while I was in high school, driving down there and going to fires on Pitkin Avenue, Sutter Avenue, the whole bit. And uh, yeah, so, uh, and I, next day I'd be like in, in school at Archbishop Malloy High School. No, you guys went to Malloy? Like, I went to Malloy. Hey, class Malloy boy. Hey, Malloy boy. Guys would be like, hey. they'd be like, I smell a campfire. And like, you know, I was still reeking the smoke from the fire. <laughs> And uh, yeah, Dude, your so, mother had to be, she had to be a saint, a saint to do that. Dude, That's it, got to be every saint. night. It had to happen it's every night. The most. It, it was happening. It had to be time. every night. It's not like it happened once a week. You know what I mean? It was happening. My wife no, doesn't all the even time. allow. No, no. My wife doesn't even allow like the phones at the dinner table, let alone a scanner sitting there. You know? <laughs> I mean, forget it, dude. Yeah. So, your mother, no, beautiful no. lady. It's unfortunate you didn't get any of her looks. For God's sakes. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> oh, Ruffy, nice. I am. Uh, uh, my sister and I are so blessed to have had her in my no, it's in great. Our lives. That's great. I mean, Pretty she's uh, she's really so. Um, when I was probably about three years old, and this goes back to mom also. Herb eyes very good friends with my father. Uh, this is like probably like 1969. Herb comes over to hang out. We had the house in Richmond Hill, and um, it's a pretty. It's like December, January, a bit of cold day. And uh, my father had to go get paint down on Jamaica Avenue or actually Liberty Avenue on 170th Street. And um, Herb uh, goes, um, yeah, I'll go with you. Well, they get a job in a, like a one-story commercial, like right down the block, turns into a fifth alarm. No so way. my father puts me in my, the brand new white snowsuit that my mother got me. I mean, it's like almost like, remember like George? The Michelin uh, Man. Uh, <laughs> the Michelin Man. Exactly. That's what I look like. And I'm in this thing. I'm three years old. And the fire, this brand flying everywhere, bill, <laughs> the smoke billowing everywhere. And all the brand is landing. Landing on, on the my, coat, burning everything. On my brand new white like <laughs> snowsuit. And, you know, and we're at the fire for like three hours. You know, I think oh, I was like, you're flaming. My, my phone is going like, not me down like this. Good God, so, man. <laughs> she, we, Herb and my father, you know, they take me back home, and my mother gets home, and she's like, Howie, what happened? What did you do to our son? Look at this. I just got him this thing. <laughs> destroyed. Totally destroyed. Absolutely destroyed. She, she, looked Absolutely. Like she, she looked like she wouldn't take any stuff either. You know what I mean? Like, she was tough she, when she had to be, right? Um. Yeah. You know what? I, she finally got to the point where um, she stopped cooking for us. <laughs> <laughs> It's you're on your own. Sorry. Yeah, because you're going to be jetting at any time, right? I mean, yes. I didn't yes. realize that I that mean, you, you were doing that with your father, like, like oh. really buffing out on the jobs. Like, I didn't know that. Absolutely. This, this, this Absolutely. level of buffed them, I have never seen. <laughs> well, but but the only oh, difference, man. Come on. These man. guys, both these guys had a, a career like that. Well, that's really, what I'm saying. Most of the time, right down to reserve for the guy who. Right, you know, exactly. Yeah, That's the way it's yeah. the perception is anyway. I mean, the, the the fact that your father did all that stuff and then had the career. Coops, where where did he work? You had it written down, right? Where where does father work? Just to go through uh, it quick. I only got out. He went to uh two seventy seven engine. Went to uh, ladder one seventy five, rescue four, lieutenant one twenty, captain of one twenty four. 
That's so he's never really seen any fire. No, no. <laughs> in the chief for the five in the, one, six, for in the, the chief for the five one. Yeah. In the sixties, seventies, eighties, and nineties. Yeah. yeah. Didn't see much. So <laughs> and he knew all the right um, people. But so dude, you know, I was just gonna say, but your father didn't have uh, you know, one of the uh one of those guys to get him to these places, right? Nobody. Oh, like no, I did? No, nobody at all. <laughs> oh, Billy's cut, huh? bro. I was setting you up there, kid. It, there he is uh, with Jack Cleehouse, and that was my father was I, lieutenant look, in 120. I told and, you uh, we get Cleehouse on the show. <laughs> there you go. You got him on. It took me to get on the show to get him on. My, McVeigh said, Mikey McVeigh said that, that that was your father's best man. Is that right? Or vice versa? Um, Jack Cleos, yes, yes. He was the uh, best man. Audie O'Leary was uh, in the wedding party. Um, Audie's a uh, was a legend in Boston, and uh, just he brought Audie O'Leary brought so many people together uh, in the fire in the fire service, like all over the country, and uh, just uh, you know part of the family, you know. And uh, but that's Jack and I. We talk all the time, and uh, but you know. Buffing, yes, it was in my blood. I remember um, I had probably, let's see, 19, it was August 2nd, 1978, and I had finished my paper out. I was 12 years old. And my father was in Rescue 4, and he, uh, he he worked in 316 engine the night before. And he comes home, it's about 9, nine o'clock. He goes, Billy, there's a really bad fire in uh, Brooklyn. I'm going to it. Uh, do you want to go with me? And I said, yeah, Dad. And um, it was Ocean Parkway, and it was the wall bounce fire. Wow. And um, wow. we got there, and, uh, you know, my father had all his gear. He goes, um, I got to go to work. And I said, Dad, just be careful. And I actually went on top of a building right on Ocean Avenue. You know, here I am, 12 years old, I know how to get to the roof already. And uh, <laughs> I... I get to the roof of a building right where they, they breached the wall on the exposure to side to, um, to get to the guys, you know, the, you know, guys that fell, it was a rain roof fire was between the rain roof and the actual roof. Some guys fell all the way through and lived the guys that got caught up in the rain roof were the guys that died. And, um, I remember watching them breach the wall and, there had to be a hundred firemen and the helmets were at their, you know, at their heart as they took the six firefighters out. And, uh, you know, I mean, at 12 years of age, seeing that, you know, it kind of, you know, very, had a lot of different emotions. Sober, uh, even at that age, right? Absolutely. absolutely. I mean, that, especially when you think you want to do that job, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. No. Plus his father's on the job, you know, and then he maybe starts, for, for for a guy who loved the job so much, maybe he didn't really think about it that much at 12 years old. Now, all of a sudden, he's looking at his father going to work. Now he's thinking, holy shit, that can happen to my old man. You know what I mean? Yeah. But, I mean, there was a probie. There was a probie that was waving to his family. They yeah, yes. We did We did a, we did a show yeah. on that, and I didn't know that. That you was know? a really incredible uh, – that was an incredible you know, story, man. I didn't know that about that guy. So, anyway, all – Four, at the time, there was only four rescues, and all four rescues were, uh, you know, dispatched to the scene. And I've, you know, I started to have a thing for Manhattan, just being intrigued by the big city, and uh, so I had a lot of interest in Rescue One. And um, I'm, I, I come down from being on the rooftop, and I run into the lieutenant from Rescue One that day, and uh, it was Jimmy Curran, who. Um, Became one of my best friends in the whole fire department. And Pete, I think you have a picture of Jimmy Curran. I do. I was just going to pull it up. <clears throat> Stand by, guys. Here it comes. That's nice. Jimmy Curran when he was in Rescue 4. And Jimmy Curran, I think, was in 116 truck for about a year and got to Rescue 4. The guy was so talented. And it was a... Um, Lieutenant in Rescue One, and um, he um, he was the president of the Burn Center. Yeah, I mean, he, and, he was the uh, main guy, man, for a long, long time. Long time. Absolutely. Absolutely. And um, he got me involved in the Burn Center. And, uh, you know, I, I am now, uh, you know, I'm the vice president of the Burn Center. 
and uh, kind of wish I wasn't because uh, the former vice president of the New York Five Fires Burn Center Foundation was Jeff Giordano, who we lost on September 11th. He was in three truck. And, uh, you know, my buddy Billy Leahy is the president now. And, uh, you know, Jimmy exposed me to so much on the job and um, getting involved in, you know, like if you're going to step up to do something, what better thing as a firefighter to get to you know, step up than to work with, you know, burn survivors and raising money for burn care? I mean, because if, if we pull someone out of a burning building and then they just die in a hospital because they don't have the best burn care in the country, then what good is that? And that's what Jimmy was all about. Jimmy was all about raising money and training and teaching the nurses and the doctors up at New York Presbyterian Hospital. Not every, not and, every city uh, has a burn center, right, Bill? I mean, it's not. not well, not not as, as good as New York Presbyterian. I mean, St. Barnabas is great in Jersey. I mean, different cities have a good burn unit. But, um, you know, it was guys like James Curran who really just, uh, you know, just helped develop what New York Presbyterian has. So at least as firefighters and when we pull someone out, at least we know we have a place to go to where we yeah, have. Yeah, no, listen, every time somebody got burnt, any time, no matter even if it was a small burn, they were going to the burn center, right? I mean, yeah. most of the time oh, they yeah. were going, they got in the ambulance you know, and, and you were going there. No, no, no questions yeah. asked. So getting involved, getting involved with the burn center, um, we would have fundraisers and, you know, and, a lot, and they were great. So there was this one particular time we were doing a uh, raising money and we had a uh, fundraiser, just pretty much like a, a keg party at the fire museum. And, you know, allegedly, you know, Allegedly, twenty dollars to get in the whole bit. So I, um, I let a, I was still in two thirty five, but I let a buddy of mine know about it, and he was working uh, light duty in the rack unit. And um, he, I go, listen, why don't you come down? You know, you can help out. You know, at the uh, you're in the rack unit up in ninety one engine. Come on down. So I goes, absolutely, I'll come down. So he comes down, and you know, he might might have one or two allegedly. Um, but he's in the back he's, and he's helping us clean up at the end of the night. So he goes, uh, Hey Billy, um, what are you going to do with that? That, that keg's almost full. What are you going to do with the kegs? I go, well, I got to bring them back to that beer distributor by one seventeen in the morning. He goes, I got it. I'll, I'll take it back. I'm going. That <laughs> so this can't be good. <laughs> I don't hear this till about three weeks later. Oh boy. My buddy goes, you know, so-and-so I go, yeah. He goes, he was driving, riding around Harlem in the Bronx, going to jobs all over the place, going, hey, Norton, I got water, I got Gatorade, <laughs> and I got Budweiser. <laughs> Sick bastard. <laughs> oh, yes. Out of his yes. Absolutely. But we didn't say his name, so we're good. Nobody. Yeah, knows. no, I don't even know who you mean. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. But, He's uh, probably watching that uh, silly yeah. goose. Hey, and, hey, Billy, uh, why did your father go to, because uh, he was in Brooklyn, uh, looks like most of his career, why did he go to that rescue forward and not two? He, um, you know, I think it was probably a, a less weight. I mean, rescue two was lined up big time. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, it was the old firehouse. It was way where he started out, you know, the old neighborhood. Right. And, uh and he had a great time there. He uh, Daily said he was you know, in, he, he was assigned to 292. When your father yep. was there, yeah. So that's pretty funny. And uh, yeah, Ray, Ray actually used to work with him on the side, uh, spray painting. No shit. My father used. To, my father had a spray painting company. <laughs> I fucking um, love it, man. Doing, you never like, know who knows who, right? stuff. Oh yeah. yeah, but and I asked my father like sometimes like I go, why are we like we see to have me work with him? He used to like three months after a line of duty funeral, he would call up the widow. And uh, offer to paint their house, you know, Shit. spray paint the whole house. Just, you know, that was something that wow. he gave back from his uh, work spray painting. But uh, his spray painting uh, kept a lot of guys going with side work. And, uh, you know, like we had to, uh, we painted, spray painted Warren Fuchs' house, um, <laughs> the, the inside. 
And and he and he told me he goes. Does it say saddle up on the outside? Yeah. No, he goes. This this is an investment in your future. <laughs> he goes because and he was right. I mean, you know, it was that I'd give Warren the call and you know the hook would be in and uh, uh -huh. all good. You know. Oh, he know how so, to do uh, it. You got to schmooze. You got to schmooze it. Absolutely. So I actually, when my father's in rescue four, I was riding with him, but I go to my god dad. I really want to catch first do work. Rescue four, right? Catch a first do work. Like I'm a buff snob already. I'm like 14 <laughs> years old. So <laughs> George Isa was um, very good friends of mine. And uh, you know, George and Herb and his son Chris, I work with the 111. But um, George said I could start riding with him in 124 truck. So I'm like a sophomore in high school and I'm riding in 124. And it was funny because uh, Jim Ellison Sr. Uh, was a lieutenant there also. So Jimmy, Ju you know, Jimmy uh, and I would we do like we'd have to call each other up and like do mutuals like on who's going to ride because you can't have two guys on the road. Oh, so, is that like, right? You know, yeah, I go, <laughs> I go, Jimmy, uh, are you going in tonight? All right, you mind if I go in? Okay, great. And no, uh, shit, I rode with them for a bunch of years. Funny man, but um, I did take and actually. The night of this fire, very sad fire, was on Evergreen and Troutman, and they lost three kids. I was riding with George Isa in 124, and Jimmy was riding with his dad. His dad must have taken overtime in 112. And uh, Pete, do you have the photo? Uh, a newspaper. From the, the newspaper photo? I sure do. This is a great picture. I'm going to post this up tomorrow on Instagram. I'll... On the Daily News here. I took that this guy. photo, and uh, right, so that's a three-story brick. Um, and that's Mike Kaloran, who an amazing guy. And, you know, he threw up portable and he was short for the third floor. So what does he do? Because he's trying so hard to get into that window. He just boosts himself up on that sill there and he's trying to get in. It eventually lit up off there and he, he hung back down to get, uh, back onto the ladder. But if that doesn't show the effort of a firefighter yeah, man. trying to no, save someone. There, there's there's no other. So what was kind of cool about this photo, I I took a series of photos and um, I call up the Daily News and they go, yeah, send the roll of film. And I send the roll of film and, and they tell me, yeah, you, you got to cover the Daily News. And so it was like the day later, I'm on the J train going to Archbishop Malloy High School. And people are reading the paper. <laughs> Back then, everyone's reading the Daily the paper. News. So if you look down the row, it was just your picture. picture. Was yeah, like, yeah, yeah. No, yeah, I know exactly what you're talking about. Yeah, I used and to drive going, the train too. Everybody read yeah, the paper. And I go, how cool is that? And, hmm. uh, Did you ever put that? You, know, you should have put that negative. Did you get the picture done and put it like on a plaque or something? That's a pretty. Uh, I mean, unfortunately, it's a it's, crappy story, but it's, it's a, a great picture. Story. Uh, I got photos of it. Yeah, I do have that. And uh, that's a great picture that the guy. You don't see. You know, guys. Uh, Doing those types of things very few times anymore, you know. I mean, that's there's incredible. a picture. You, you ever see the picture of four, I think it was forty truck, uh, where the, he's going from one window sill. Yeah, to yeah, the other, yeah, it's incredible. Off the fire escape, the old school. Yeah, and the guy's holding him with the hook. Yeah, yeah, it's incredible. You know, you know. So Could you imagine uh, that? You doing yeah. that today <laughs> with no, the chief no, in the street? No. <laughs> yeah. I'd no. be like, oh, I just dropped my cell phone. I can't make it <laughs> you know, Holy but shit. that's uh yeah. So I my father uh eventually got the spot in 120 truck and um I uh I was riding with them in 120 and uh, where are they? Watkins Street. I could just say Watkins Street and everyone knows. But uh I had a great continue. time. I had a great time. Yep, there I am. And uh, wow, <laughs> dude, what the I hell know, is would, that? Wow. That's called the perm, and they were in oh. style in 1986. I don't know about that. I don't but, see any other perms. Maybe well, look the black what happened. Guy. Look, you look, you look, look, look like the guy from uh, Welcome Back, Carter. With the, uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Huh. Or Mikey so, Miller's uh, brother. I don't know. Go ahead. What are you going to say? Go. Oh, Mikey Miller's um, brother too. <laughs> <laughs> so the guy um, next to is uh, my father is Tom Cleary, who uh, Tom was my father's chauffeur. And um, Tom, he finally made lieutenant with about 
20 years on. And he covered for about five tours and became my father's lieutenant in 124. Wow. And uh, Tom Cleary, I, you know, he passed a couple of years ago. His, uh, his son is a 111 wow. truck. Tom, I believe, had three class threes and never got a medal. That's back in the day. You know, they, they, weren't, just didn't, they weren't just giving them out for uh, taking somebody out the window uh, onto yeah. the ladder, you know? No, no, no. Uh, and Tom Cleary was just an absolute amazing guy. So a story that I like to tell with my father when he, uh, after, after lunch in, on, on Watkins Street, he would like to uh, have a drill. But he'd like to, you know, maybe have a little tea with his drill and invite the chief down and everything. But it really wasn't tea. He would take a little VO, put it in a coffee cup. He'd take a tea bag. He'd take the bag <laughs> off the string, Love throw it. it in the garbage, <laughs> and just sit there with the string, drinking. And going, Allegedly. Yeah, okay. <laughs> you you want to raise up that port? Oh, All right, great. My yeah, God. great job there, Brian. Fantastic, dude! Fantastic. That's great. <laughs> it's all about the props, right? It's all about exactly. the props, man. It's all, all about the props. <laughs> and even some Jamesons. Oh, oh! Man. oh! Hey, uh, Chief Cleehouse in the chat is saying how he sprayed the whole interior of my old Queen Anne in Richmond Hill and the basement of the one of 108's new quarters on Union Ave. Then the interior of R2 when we moved to Bergen Street, all just uh, for the money for the paint. What a great guy, man. And yeah. that's that's so true. That is absolutely true. And he had with with Rescue Two's quarters. I did all the masking and the scraping also. And uh, you know what? That's uh, he was talented with that. And uh, he, you know, he would he, like you said he gave a lot of guys side work with it. It's a skill, uh, man. I had all my, my, my I had all my buddies in high school when he came to this country. It's a real skill. Uh, it's something that I didn't pick up. <laughs> I don't know. You, you had. Well, you had uh, all those guys. You had Schweiger was Pat Schweiger was there, and oh, yeah, Patty well, Lee uh, was there. All those guys. Yeah, well, yeah. Schweig, Schweiger used to work with my father. Uh, uh, Mike Schweiger used to. Uh, oh, you talking about the painting on the firehouse uh, when I wrote? Yeah, when yeah. I wrote in one twenty four. Absolutely, Patty Schweiger. Um, yeah, you had Patty Lee, um, Bobby Speck, Mike Kogan, uh, Mike Killerin. Um, oh my God, Frankie the Fixer McVeigh. I mean, it was <laughs> these guys were characters, and uh, as long as I kept my mouth shut, but I, it actually Pete Gancy was a lieutenant. That's right. I yeah, rode yeah, with yeah. Pete Gancy when he was a lieutenant, one twenty four, and then he became my chief when I went to two thirty five, hmm. and uh, he was awesome. He was uh, absolutely. But I, I had some great times there, and you know, I was in high school and uh, just uh, learned about about learned a lot about life. Just hanging around the firehouse. The guys treated me well, as long as I was respectful. Kept my mouth shut. Keep your mouth shut, so, exactly. Somebody, somebody and, uh, in the chat said, "Did your old man painted the buildings up at the Children's Burn Center camp as well?" Yes, he did. Yes, he did. And the burn camp, uh, well, once again through Jimmy Curran, I got involved in the burn camp uh, in 1996. And the burn camp is up in Union, Connecticut, and we get 80 kids for two weeks during the summer. Wow. And uh, from the whole tri-state area. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, all burn survives. And what's really great about the camp, it's the Otluff burn camp. Um, you know, a kid in that town, you know, they're physically scarred. Everybody knows. Yeah, yeah, burn yeah, camp. yeah, yeah. You put 80 kids together, hey, you're just like me. Yeah, yeah, Come that's on. good for them. Let's right, go play right, football. Right. Right. So I um I got involved with a ropes course up there where the kids uh would climb up Burma uh, bridges, rock walls, and uh you know they're on belay. Right. And you just uh you know you capture them if they fall off the thing you just kept capture them on belay. And I um we had a kid from East New York, Brooklyn. He's climbing up a fifty foot rock wall, like ten years old, and he had a prosthetic arm, and he gets like. 25 feet up this 50 foot rock wall. He goes, he goes to reach up, oh he goes to pull, his arm falls off, <laughs> and he watches it fall. He slams into the uh to the rock climbing wall. I catch him on belay and I go, Are you right there, Jimmy? He goes, Fuck that, I don't need that anyway. Just with the one <laughs> arm, he went up. And me just giving him a little bit on the belay yeah, yeah, makes yeah, it all yeah, the way yeah, up yeah. to the top. Nice. Wow. What I 
I learn every year from that camp. I I learned, you know, how grateful I am for everything I've had. Yeah, and I it's learned, great. You know, the toughness of these kids. I learn lessons every year. And my wonderful wife, Paula, on our third date goes, um, I swam at University of Pittsburgh and NYU. Where do I sign up for the camp? And she ran the waterfront for 15 years. You know, I'm just, just, just going to uh, tell you, Bill, when, when we got on early in the pre-show and she came in to help you hook up everything in the computer, you know, there's different stages of of marrying up. You know, when we say marrying up, uh, yeah, I, you know, I was saying I was going to let you say it, Ruff. There's the general marrying up, and then there's the marrying up, <laughs> yeah. and then right, right there's the holy shit, man. Yeah, yeah. you he really married up. up. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The, the well, the <laughs> um, I met her, and we'll go when I was in Ford truck. I'm there, not even a year, and. She walks on past the firehouse on the apron, and uh, we start talking. Two weeks later, we go on a date. Three months later, we're living together. I tell her to this day, Paula, you fucked up my whole Midtown experience. I didn't last a year. As right, a right. You're supposed to be sore. <laughs> what do they say? Uh, sowing your oats or something? You know, like yes, uh, yes, sowing yes. His royal oats. Um, sowing <laughs> his royal oats. And Bill, before I forget, Joel Kanaski was in the chat. He's in the chat. He wants oh. to say hello. <clears throat> Tell Joel I said hello, man. You just he's did. Dowling, Dowling he's Dowling says he's living hello. Some, who does? Uh, was it Ryan Dowling or Richie Dowling? Who was it? It was a Dowling. Right. Um, I don't know. A bunch of guys were saying hello in the chat. Everyone's friendly. So I, I actually, my fire service career started in 19... 19- 85, I get on the New York City Fire Patrol, and uh, I go to Fire Patrol 2 down in uh, the village. Uh, Anderson Cooper actually owns the building now. Oh, yeah, and, yeah. Uh, we, we looked at that building. Yeah. I mean, how great is it? I'm, like, I'm 18 incredible. years old, and I'm on the Fire Patrol. And, uh, you know, we would tell, like, you know, we go to the bars, and they would go, oh, yeah, we're at Fire Patrol 2. What's Fire Patrol? Ah, we're well, like rescue, you know, like we're, well, they don't know that we're running around. <laughs> Make you know, grabs. I don't like to talk running. about it. Right. Yeah, 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 I, I don't want to talk. <laughs> People I don't realize we're running around with squeegees and throwing <laughs> canvas covers <laughs> over <laughs> merchandise. <laughs> and, you know, well, no, we're rescue. Showing Why up when everything's spread? out. <laughs> <laughs> I remember. Getting I remember paid. Some, I, I remember some girl I brought back to the firehouse one night. She goes, what are all those things on the uh, the side of the wall? And it was the, the canvas covers that we have. I, I cut them. I go, oh, they're body bags. You know? <laughs> <laughs> it was for rescue, you know. <laughs> oh, shit. Sorry, it was and, Ralph uh, Dowling the guys are telling me, guys. Sorry. Oh, Ralph, da- Ralph Dowling from Boston. Awesome. Awesome. Uh, union guy and big in Boston uh, fire department. Um, so the fire patrol was great because I was going to John Jay full time. And, uh, you know, taking fire and emergency service, which, you know, I have a degree to go next to my wife's master's, but it was great. Just 18 years old. We did say you married up, right? There's multi levels. I know. There's multi levels of marrying up. I'm running around the fires and, you know, and getting paid at 18 years old. And this is awesome. And uh, it was a lot of fun. But I was was on the phone last night with uh, George Munch and, um, we were talking, and he has a great fire patrol story. So, does every, everyone knows? I mean, you guys know what the fire patrol is. Yes. But maybe some of the other listeners, what the fire patrol was, they got disbanded in, I believe, 2004 because some accountant figured that the real estate was worth more than what they were actually bringing in. There you go. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, the real estate was worth more than what we were saving in property. And that's why the, the patrol got uh, closed, which is very sad. Um, but I had two great years. And a lot of guys that came on our job started off in the fire patrol. I mean, Patty Brown was in the fire patrol. Yeah, so I just uh, saw that recently. Ielpi, I know Jonathan yeah. Ielpi was in. Uh, jo- Jonathan Ielpi, um, all the Gregory brothers. Um, oh, really? I didn't know was, that. Uh, uh-huh. Yeah, and Bobby Austin. Was in the fire patrol. No shit. Yes, Bobby Austin was in the fire patrol. Uh, my buddy Audie Workle, who I worked with as a cop. You know, so there's a long list of uh, alumni in the fire patrol. So George Munch is part of that alumni. And uh, he tells a story where he was driving fire patrol three. 
and um, they had a job down um, down by the old Watchtower building, down by the Brooklyn Bridge. And you know they're up there, they're throwing covers, you know. And for those of you who aren't familiar with the fire patrol, we would have these canvas covers, and you go to the floor below the fire where the water is coming down, and you throw the canvas covers over the merchandise, save the merchandise, so the insurance company wouldn't have to lay out as much money as you know. You're pretty much you're salvaging uh, the, the merchandise and strictly in commercial buildings. So they got this job in this big factory down uh, down underneath the Brooklyn Bridge. And uh, they're up there throwing covers. George is by the rig. He goes up to see what's happening. A fire's on, like, you know, the, they're throwing covers on the fourth <laughs> floor. And uh, the officer goes, George, why aren't you by the rig? I just wanted to come up here to see what's going on. George, go back down to the rig. He goes back down. Ten minutes later, he goes back up again. He's looking around. They go, George, what did I tell you? Get down with the rig. So 15 minutes later, he's back up there with his hands in his pockets, watching him do the work. The lieutenant goes, are you kidding me, George? Just stay down at the rig. He pulls open one of those, like, big freight elevators in those commercial buildings, and he pulls it open, and there's the fire patrol rig with the lights going around and everything. <laughs> the rig's right here. I'm with the rig. Come on. Oh, it's like one of those huge commercial things, huh? That's great. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's great. And uh, yeah, that's I, I I could just imagine pulling open the elevator and seeing those lights going like this. I go, look, I'm with the rig. <laughs> Bill, uh, Chief Cleahouse said Bill uh, Chief Feehan was uh, in fire patrol. I'm assuming that's what he was yes, saying. And uh, Neil Mullane is in the chat. He said that John uh, was also John Feehan was in uh, was in fire patrol. Fire patrol? That's, I didn't know. Uh, that. They're both true. Um, so. Fast forwarding, um, John Feehan's first fire, um, he backed me up uh, in 235. We had a job on, uh, it was like Tompkins in the Fulton, you know, about nine o'clock at night. Who backed you and, up? Uh, John he, Feehan. John no Feehan shit. was one of my pro, was a pro. I didn't in know that he was there. I did not know he Absolutely. was there. Oh, he had, he had some rotation. He's in 235. Then he goes to 114 truck. They were having this centennial. And he wins the Centennial raffle and gets like ten thousand dollars. <laughs> of course. And then he goes to two fifty. Then he happens to go to two fifty two, right? And that's, and they that's make where I start. thought he was assigned. <laughs> I didn't know he was on the rotation. No, I thought he was in two fifty two. I didn't know. So that. And, and John and I, he's a great friend of mine. So what I liked about John was that he was like one of the only single guys in two thirty five. So we'd go out, you know, drinking every once in a while. So we're up in Bayside one night, and John lived with his dad. In Flushing, they had an old Victorian house in Flushing. And, you know, we're hanging out. He goes, ah, Billy, you know what? Why don't you spend the night over, you know, to my house? I go, all right, great. So I'm on the couch, right? And at the time, I think uh, Bill Feehan was uh, first deputy commissioner. So, like, I'm in my underwear laying on the couch. And, like, 730 in the morning, I see Bill Feehan walking down the stairs, from, you know, for the second floor. And I stand up my underwear. How you doing? <laughs> I'm like, you. I'm like, you know. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, shit, I'm at John Feehan's house. Of course his father's going to be there. Holy and Christ. Bill Feehan goes, hey, Billy, good to see you. He goes, I'm making bacon eggs. You want some? Yeah, right. <laughs> and there I am, oh, bacon and geez. eggs in my underwear. Um yeah, John, John, John's great, and uh, he's a chief of the 2 8 Battalion now. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, so 1987, I I mean, I love the Fire Patrol, but I wanted to get the clock rolling. Um, I, I go on the NYPD. And um, that <laughs> that's, that's a photo from Knickerbocker Avenue and Troutwood Street. And, uh, just, and that's the old Grand Furies. So and notice where my my holster is. It's <laughs> in my say. crutch. Well, because when you were in the car and you know people were right. coming up to you, you would kind of put your, you know, you don't know if they're gonna shoot you. So I'd have my hand on right. my gun. If it was on your side, and, you couldn't it wouldn't be good, right? It would right, be too right. far over. But what was funny about having it there, all right. So <clears throat> picture it's there all day. So all right, breakfast, you're having two donuts, lunch, you're having, you know a nice sandwich, you know, pizza, and all the crumbs we get into that holster. So you'd go up to the shooting range and you'd have to, gun? you'd have, you'd have to draw and, and present. And like the instructor would look at your gun and go, 
Are you kidding me? Look at it. It's like half a ham sandwich on there. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so uh, did all the guys uh, carry I, it like that, Bill? That's we all. Well, until you got the automatics, uh, a lot of us. That was a swivel holster, and that was a thirty-eight. That was a Ruger six shot thirty-eight police series. 38. Still have that one? I and no, nope, I uh, allegedly. I actually sold. I sold both my guns. When I uh, came on the job, because they were a hassle. Like, you know, you always have to watch out for them. If, like, if I was home, I would actually put my handcuffs um, through the gun so you couldn't close the barrel. Uh, it's, you know, I mean, it's a responsibility. After last summer, I wish I had these guns, but. Uh, yeah, you yeah, know, yeah. I, mean, I got gotcha. uh, well, um, you. Well, know, if you need one, just come over to my house. I got a bunch of extra lying around, you know. Oh, thank I'm you. Really that, is <laughs> that is Brian Carroll. Who is still one of my best friends? Um, they call yeah. we used to call we used to call him Robert Goulet. I don't know. If he, he looks Robert like a Goulet cop. Was that Robert guy looks like a kid. cop. Yes, yes, he was. Oh, he was the real deal too. He's got he a couple got of out. Uh, citations on top of that badge there too. It looks he, like he, he look. He looks like Ray Downey. I mean, yeah. look at him. Like he has all the. He came on the job. There was a class in 1968 where they. They went into the academy and crime was so rampant. They went out into the street and like five months later, they tried to get him back into the academy. And they're like, are you kidding me? I've already been in two shootings. This guy, you know, was in this and that, you know, they were like unteachable by then. Right. And uh, he was part of that class. And uh, I play Santa Claus for his uh, grandchildren every, uh, every winter. Oh, and uh, he bounces between uh, here in Florida. Brian Carroll is his name, and just uh, how old is he, he now? Um, he's he's in his late seventies, um, but uh, he he actually uh, got me uh, skiing. I, he ran a trip to Grey Rocks, and uh, he uh, he taught me how to ski back when I first got on the fire department. Hmm. Um, and just an absolute awesome guy. So um, there was a so, question in the chat that right? came up before, and maybe you're going to address it now. But I got to ask because like 88 people were like, "Why is it that?" Everyone goes from the NYPD to the FDNY. Um, and that's it's. I did it. You know, I went to the NYPD first because I think it was easy to get on. You know, they take more. It wasn't as competitive, and you know, you, you got the, the clock starting. I mean, so when I when I went on the fight upon nineteen ninety one, I had almost five years uh, five so, years under my belt that counted up front. I was when I was in probate school, I was making first grade pay. Hmm. You know, and they changed uh, that, right, Bill? The the PD yes, yep. went on the back end, then, right? Is that what happened? Absolutely, yes. They uh, for that reason on the back end, uh, for that reason. Um, and I'll be honest with you, I <laughs> I love being a cop. Uh, being a police officer was, I I'm still friends with thirty guys I work with on the PD, and there is not a people ask me what was the best part about being a New York City police officer, and when you got on that radio, like say, you know, shots fired, you're chasing a perp, and you went on that radio and yelled 83I to the central, 85 forthwith. Soon as you said that, the whole neighborhood just echoed in sirens. The cavalry was coming. As soon as you got on that radio, and it was just the best feeling in the world. I could see that, man. You know, I could yeah. see that. Th that's that's important. Yeah. You still, you think was, it's uh, like that, really? I, I think that's still the way it is today, right, Bill? I mean, it's like that now. I mean, it's, I've seen it a few times, you know, being on the job, uh, you know, where guys. You would, uh, hope, you would hope so. But I I mean, the NYPD, police, law enforcement in general, they yeah, just take it. Yeah, they're taking a beat. It's, 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 it's real tough. And, uh, you know, I mean, I, I'm so proud. I have some great friends that are uh, high up in the PD and in different cities. And uh, I'm, I'm just real proud of them. And I hope that politics, you know, doesn't get them down and uh, that they can just keep on doing their job. Because we need them. I mean, we need law okay. enforcement. <laughs> you know? Yeah. It's enough so, already. It's enough. It's enough so already with this shit. When I got on the PD, I, all right, so 1987, I had a hook. And my hook was supposed to get me to NSU 2, which neighbor neighborhood stabilization unit and on uh, the Lower East Side of Manhattan. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to, you know, 20 years old, I want to hang out with punk rock chicks and, you know, do that whole scene on St. Mark's Place. 
Well, so the day they're reading out the orders, remember, Carlson, Devereaux, NSU 5, wear your vest. <laughs> where my the fuck is that? So I raised my hand. I go, excuse me, sir. Um, where's NSU five? He goes, Washington Heights. I go, Washington. What? I've never heard of it. Right? Uh, I never heard of Washington. Washington right? What? Yeah. Where your vest? DC. <laughs> what? Man. So, so I'm up. I'm up there with this guy Frank Devereaux. We're in the academy together, and uh, I mean, it's running rampant. I mean, it's it's crazy. It's all. You know, loaded, you know, I mean, six story tenements throughout the whole neighborhood, just packed to the gills. You know, people, you know, just loud Hispanic music cranking all hours of the day, the whole bit. So, um, you know, I'm like, all right, whatever. So, three months in, now I'm the senior rookie. I get uh, this guy, uh, Jorge Jimenez, and I'm breaking him in. He comes out of like, they had like a middle class uh, between my class and the, and the July class. So uh, I'm showing them the ropes because I know the ropes. I got three months, three months on the job now, right? And we're on like three water pot and him anyway. It didn't matter, right? <laughs> right. So we're on one, one, six, seven, and Audubon, and that's a foot post. Now I didn't know this. I mean, I, I think I got everything under control. These, you know, these drug dealers were dealing drugs under my nose, like all over the place. So I go, I go, I go, I go, I go, Jorge. The people in this neighborhood, they love me. Watch this. Hola, amigo. I, and they turn around and they go, hey, Maticone, Maticone. <laughs> so Jorge looks at me and goes, what? I go, what are you laughing? He goes, dude, they just called you a motherfucker. <laughs> um, Maticone. I did, I did have one interesting um, collar up in uh, Washington Heights. Uh, we, so we were in NSU, and we'd have to run down um, – to where we get assigned to the like four precincts in that NSU. So I, um, me and my partner Frank, we get assigned to the 3 0. We run down to the desk. We think we're going to be in a patrol car. We have to go watch a crime scene on 138th Street and uh, right off of Broadway. And we get there and it's down in the basement of a tenement, a basement apartment. And um, we walk in and there's a body right in the hallway, uh, like a 24 year old Hispanic woman. She's dead. And the guy, this uh, detective goes, hey, nice to meet you. My name's Mickey Moran. Come on in the back here. And the back there is these, all these trains, like Lionel trains. And there's these three detectives that are playing with the trains. And they go, oh, yeah, you're here for He goes, listen, he goes, the guy that shot her lives in the apartment. He's going to come back to either get the guns Take care of the body or play with his trains. His name is Amtrak and he's dressed in a conductor's outfit. I'm like, really? All right. <laughs> they go, we have to go get a search, we have to go get a search warrant. So they just leave me and my buddy Frank Devereaux it, with this body, with these guns, and this train set. But what do we do? We take all the <laughs> and this we train take set. all the we take all the crime scene tape down, making it like the place was untouched. And they leave, they go. Get the, I guess the search warrant. I go downtown. Fifteen minutes later, the door opens up. There's a guy in a conductor's outfit walking in. I go, Frank, it's him, right? So we wait for him to get like halfway through, and we go, Police, don't move! He has a bag of McDonald's. He throws it at me. I start chasing him out. I tackle him right over the body, and we had a homicide collar. I had like three months on. They wouldn't let us take the collar. Uh, the detectives took it, but they let us, uh, you know, sit in on the uh, the whole interrogation. We made some overtime out of it, and we got a nice accommodation out of it. Very and, nice. Uh, nice. You know, and then what kind I, of McDonald's I, was it? I don't know. <laughs> Big Mac. So, so my hook finally goes, heard him. goes. My hook goes. All right, listen. Uh, I'm sorry about you know, like you know, you ran a shoe. I sorry I couldn't get you down the lower east side. But where do you want to go? You want to go out to Bayside, the 111. You want to go out to Douglas, then I go, nah, I want to go to Bushwick, the A3 prison. And they're like, really? You want to go to Bushwick? And uh, I ended up in Bushwick for four years. And Bushwick was unbelievable. It was, uh, I mean, 1988, Bushwick, Brooklyn. As my buddy Paul Fischetti loves when I say, crack was whack. 
<laughs> and it was out of control. Putnam Avenue between Knickerbocker and Irving on any given night looked like a San Gennaro fest. I mean, there was six different types of crack and heroin going around, and it was absolutely amazing. It was just, it was <laughs> nuts. So, um, would you stop by the firehouse uh, over there occasionally? Yeah, I, I stopped by 112, uh, 277 and 112. I knew all those guys. I used to coop in uh, 252 at Mike LaRosa. That's oh, where I nice. met Mike LaRosa. Um, so we had this one night um, where my partner, Richie Rice, and I, I did late tours for like the last, uh, my last two years. And uh, we had this one particular night where as soon as we came out of the gate, the 90 precinct, which is right next door, is uh, calling for a uh, pursuit. They had a uh, shots fired and a chase in the car. And we get in the chase. And it's coming down Flushing Avenue to Bushwick Avenue. And the car, it, it turns on to Moore Street. Now, Moore Street's a one-way street going the opposite way. And this car comes flying down and crashes into this private sanitation truck and, like, just disintegrates. Three DOAs right there. So we kind of like, all right, it's a 90 precinct call. Let's go back into the A3 precinct. So we go back into the A3. As soon as we get back into our in, into the command, we go to Bushwick High School schoolyard, which is by Putnam Avenue, report of three people shot. We, we back up another sector, three DOA. We go to that. We have a person stabbed on Evergreen Avenue and Star Street. We go to a building fire with um, – they had two kids killed um, on Bushwick Avenue uh, down by, like, Decatur Street. We're finally having our first cup of coffee. It's, like, 6.30 in the morning, and we used to go up to Evergreen Cemetery, and we would like, go up there and watch the sunrise and have a coffee. So having our first cup of coffee tonight, we're watching the sunrise, and what song comes on the radio? But Louis Armstrong. What a wonderful world. <laughs> and I just, I'm drinking my coffee. And I look at my partner, Richie. He looks at me. We don't say a word. We just, I already know. and I say to myself, what a what wonderful, a wonderful world. world. <laughs> so um, I'm not going to bore you with cop stories. We, I know we're going to quite a pump, but I do have to say, people, I, when I talk about how the neighborhoods have changed, um, in 1988, I mean, Bushwick, Brooklyn was an absolute war zone. And in 1990, right before I got in the fire department, Knickerbocker Avenue and Troutman Street, my partner, Richie, and I probably responded to at least 10 homicides on that corner in one year that we were the first cops on the scene for. In one year. I can take my wife, Paul. To that same corner now and get yeah, they're drinking the cappuccino tap. now i was gonna get i can get one, one side of the street pino noir and tapas go across the street and get one of the best poured guinnesses in brooklyn mm -hmm. yeah so, it's incredible uh well i got my dream in 1991 uh 4 14 91 and i go to the fire department and um uh we, i think back then proby school was only like six weeks it was, yeah. Was, uh, that was my list. Right. You got on just before me. I did. What, uh, what was your number? I was, I don't know, like uh, 190 or something. Yeah, I was, I really was 1592. And, well, you know, I mean, I, I was working out big time. I would, when I was on the cops, I would, my meal break, we had a 330 Wilson Avenue was a uh, like 20-story project right down the block on Bleecker and Wilson. On my meal period, I would put on my shoulder holster and a 50 pound vest. So I'd have my gun here and a 50 pound vest and I'd run Walk up and down. Those yeah, 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 yeah. And, and like you'd hear the locals go, man, that crazy guy with the gun and the vest is running up and down those stairs again. But that got me the hundred that, uh, definitely. Had yeah. I got the hundred on the, I think I had a hundred and a 97 on the, on the written. I think. Right. Do you remember when we had to start the clock? It was like when you're taking the physical and it was like, all right, I'm like, Ah, oh, fuck it. I got to do it now. Bam. And then you just started. And uh, I wore a 120 shirt um, that day. <laughs> just, just, well, all the, all, all the, like, the proctors. Yeah, were, they were all firemen. Yeah. And um, 
So I wore a 120 shirt and I was running out of steam, like right at the end. I think when you went through the tunnel and um, there was a guy who just yelled out, come on, 120, nobody does it better. And I, uh, I made it through. Um, speaking of that, nobody does it better. 120 had that on there. Boom. We're nobody. So, yeah. Right. And what, what, one of the right? So 120 on their boom. Nobody does it better. What did 103 have on their aerial? Nobody. nobody. <laughs> <laughs> nice. <laughs> oh my god. Well, that was freaking like, great. Up in up in Harlem, um, 40 truck on the roof of their rig had 26 plus 14 equals 40. Nice. So, yeah, yeah, I like it. <laughs> so I think I one of those right. trucks had uh JMO written on it. Hey. Oh, oh. I hear him breathing on the on the mic. So I get my drink, 235 engine. Monroe and Noster. Absolutely. I mean, I could not ask for a better company and a better great you know, great group to work with. And uh, I um my first job there was my first night tour. Um, 961 box, which was Franklin and Fulton. And it was with uh, Joe Watts, who uh, was, you know, Jack, if you're listening, don't take this the wrong way. But Joe Watts, you are my favorite captain. And uh, he was in 28. <laughs> you better say that. 20, <laughs> he was in 28 engine. Oh, actually, I can't even say it that way. 2811 was whenever we talk about um, the Lower East Side, he always said 2811 because they were one house. But Joe Watts was a uh, firefighter in 2811 in the engine from 1963 to 1977. And didn't see no they, didn't have a big no. they didn't have a big response area, but they were in the top 10. Like every year, um, four three two box, which is Avenue C and East Fifth Street, <clears> one <throat> of the busiest boxes of all time. Could definitely put up with any like Sutter and Skank. Oh no, no doubt before. about it. We talked about that the other day. Eleven truck was one of the busiest companies. Actually, Jimmy <clears throat> Curran told me that for every job they went, when he was a lieutenant rescue one, for every job they went to up in Harlem. They'd have three jobs in the Lower East Side, all through the seventies. And uh, I liked. I'm uh, just looking at Herb. Herb Beiser, uh, He 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 kind of like what he said. Um, look at my notes here. Um, he called the lower. They used to call the Lower East Side uh, a little a little piece of the South Bronx in Manhattan, because that's what it was. Oh, that it was you know <clears throat> absolutely uh, just. Uh, a, cra a crazy place to work. And, so who's uh, the guy in the top there? That is Kevin Steininger. Kevin Steininger was a Vietnam vet. I uh, remember that guy. Uh, absolutely out of his mind. Kevin, uh, <laughs> um, we had a mice problem in the uh, – That I remember the guy did like two tours in Vietnam. All right. Came on the job in 1977 and uh, went right to 235. So we had a mice problem in the firehouse. He brought in like a little – like a 22, and allegedly – and sat on the roof of the rig and like all night long, just sitting point and you hear pop. And he was <laughs> shooting, shooting him. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. We did that in one so three, he, he used to come in early and, and, uh, you know, he'd break chops. He'd throw pots all over the place, wake us all up. So he comes in one morning and, um, he walks past the rig and, uh, throws it. We had a back a t after the kitchen, we had a back room. And he throws a mat, he lights a mat of fireworks and throws it into the back, and everyone's sleeping, right? Well, they all wake up. He didn't look. It wasn't 235. We were out of the job. It was like 235. Relocator? Relocator. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. And they're all like, what the fuck? Holy <laughs> shit. How was, hey, uh, how was Billy, did you, did you, wait, 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 uh, Billy, uh, did you know this person? Pete, you got that picture? Hold on a sec. Did you ever work with this person? Oh, the one you sent me in a... Uh, okay, yes. Okay, hold on. Coming up. 
Ah, he beat me oh, to it. Oh, Lois June one day. <laughs> yeah. That is, I, that is my great friend LJM. And um, I have a great LJM story. Uh, what was that? Her, her, her school high, picture? Her high She's school. a little hottie. Yeah, man. She oh. was in my, I told you she was in my brother's class. <laughs> uh, she, uh, yeah, she, she, she's awesome. She's uh, so. Anyway, we um, we get a job on uh, Madison and Clawson, three uh, probably like two o'clock in the afternoon, and it's in a um, brownstone, and we call it Smitty's Bike Shop because it was like it was like a Callie's mansion, and the guy had bikes all over the front of the place, and uh, the fire is coming out the uh, parlor floor. Lois has a nozzle. I'm backing her up. And we move up the stairs and everything. As we're going up, Lois mask up. And, uh, you know, she had asthma. And she takes the mask off, takes a hit of her asthma medicine, puts the mask back on, marches in there, and, like, knocks out the whole vestibule, right, up the stairs and everything. Right? She falls through the floor. She gives me the nozzle, right? And the guys below, I guess, in the basement, they knew it was her. Because all you could see is a little leg. And they go, oh, it's got to be Lois. <laughs> Lois June. <laughs> and, you know, Lo Lois June Lungay. And, you know, they pulled her up and everything. But, I mean, she kicked ass. I mean, here she was having, like, you know, a little bit of an asthma attack. She takes the, the hit and like still it. knocks down, like, most of it. She gave me the nose. Everything was done. I think I washed down. But um, she, she's awesome. She, uh, she was another person that took taught me how to ski and um we went to gray rocks together and um uh, still just a great friend of mine um one, one of my favorite yeah. lines bill she said in, in on her show was with the, what the chief gave her advice lois whatever you do unless it's the hope diamond don't steal it <laughs> 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 that was the my favorite line Oh yeah. my God! It was well, so awesome. I, I like the story with her and the ball when you know the guys, you know. With the yeah, yeah, yeah. Ball, big ball, fireman. Yeah, 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 big and, fireman. Yeah, when yeah. it came back, yeah. But um, now Lois, uh, Lois and I, uh, we talk all the time, and uh, awesome, awesome, awesome person. So when you go to a um, firehouse as a proby, you know you're hoping that you know, there's no one there that's gonna, I guess, um, take the wind out of your sails. You know, show you up or anything. You know, maybe another probie. You know, you want the, you know, you want to be the better probie, right? You want to maybe have a guy that's like, you know, screws up to make you look good. Not my case. <laughs> Charles Downey. What? AKA, AKA Chucky, Chucky, Chucky Downey? Downey. Oh my God, I didn't know that. He ran circles around. <laughs> I can't I believe mean, that. I. He got there like three months before me, and uh, I, I actually he was I was the April he was October I think of ninety, and uh, so I mean I'd come in for a day tour, you know, casual eight fifteen, you know I mean for me that's early. He'd be in there at seven o'clock. He'd already have the bunks made, the floor mop, <laughs> the rig checked, and he'd be in the house halfway, halfway through ladders three. Yeah. You know, reading. Really, I mean, he did, he did the uh, right thing. McVeigh, McVeigh said he had more pop time than you did. Let me tell you though, Chuck was a real tough act to uh, follow, and uh, I love him. I talked to yeah, him. Yeah, he's such a time. sweetheart, man. I like that guy. We had we had we had so much fun together. But like I said, uh, it was like Chuck this, Chuck that, Chuck, 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 Chuck. Chuck. <laughs> like, oh, what about me? Chuck, 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 Chuck. Uh, we, uh, yeah. Um, so my first, uh, nozzle job in 235 really is by default. And, uh, it's part of a sad story. I mean, um, we, we get a job on a Sunday afternoon on, uh, <clears throat> Irving and, uh, Putnam Irving place between Putnam and Gates. And it's a uh, top floor of a three-story brownstone. And, uh, John Rizzi has the nozzle. And I'm backing them up, and uh, we go in, and uh, we're moving in on the top floor. And uh, 
someone must have came on, you know, took the spindles out, came over, and took there's a dead man's door at the front, and they took that. So now the fire is wrapping around, and we're getting pushed in, and we still had the three quarter boots. And John's he's working hard, he's fucking trying to knock it all down and everything, but he's on top of fire, and he cracks the line, you know, all his balls, and he steams himself, and. He's like, Billy, I'm burned, I'm burned, all right? He hands me the nozzle. Now, our mm -hmm. lieutenant at the time, um, there was reports of uh, kids trapped, so he kind of uh, took off. And uh, you know, he ended up being a lieutenant in 102 and promised to stay there for his whole career. And then when Rescue 2 opened up, he became a lieutenant in Rescue 2. And, uh, <laughs> but, you know, um, anyway, so I get the nozzle. <laughs> Good segue. <laughs> I, I get I get the nozzle and I'm moving in and my vibe alert starts going off and you know, I'm still a probie and I, I'm nervous and this guy comes up and goes he knew who I was I had no idea I, I couldn't say anything I, I you know I'm, he goes Billy you got half a room here and you got the dead man's room I got my vibe alert my vibe alert. goes relax you got a window there a window there and a window there you can do this and he brings me through, you know, talks me through that half a room and then the dead man's room. And we knock it down. And when I take my face piece off, it was Lee Ielpe. No he was shit. the rescue too. No. And he talked, he talked me through that fire. I mean, he could have very easily just taken the nozzle from me and, uh, you know, just carried on. That's awesome. And, uh, he didn't, you know. Um, That's a big thing, first, though, that I think we're losing a little bit is that, you know, like – Having the guys, you know, uh, you know, chaperoning the guys and and talking them up and and pushing them through to to do those to do what he, he made you do, you know what I mean? That 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 was a big yeah. thing. It seemed like that was happened more and more. You know, I don't know if that's happening so much now. Maybe it is. Well, I don't know. He, well, here's the thing. Like, you know what? How much confidence he built in me by talking me. Right. Through. Well, that's the thing. That's if, what I'm talking about. If, if, if he was going to grab the line for me, I mean. Yeah, it would have crushed you. you know, it would have crushed me. And I would have thought every fire is like this. And, you know, it would have just, uh, I would have been ball shy the you know, rest of my career. You don't know what you can do as a new guy until somebody shows you what you can do, right? You don't know how far you can go, right? If you don't have senior guys to show you how far you can crawl into a room or how much heat you could take, you don't know, right? You might think, holy shit, there's a lot of heat. Meanwhile, mm -hmm. He's going to drag you two rooms ahead of where you're at. You know what I mean? And then you're yep. going to realize, holy shit, I could do this, you know, or the same thing with the, with the, with the line. So I think that's a big thing. And that, and the fact that he did that. And, and, and like McVeigh said, he didn't see much fire anyway in his career. Yeah, I was about to nah. Say. <laughs> <laughs> you yeah. say it all the time. But, uh, no, Lee, and I always, you know, whenever I see Lee, I see him sometimes down at the museum. And, uh, I always remind him, thank you for that. Um, so, my first real nozzle job where I was assigned a nozzle. One thing about 235, which I, I get teary-eyed when I think about, is we would get, this is the way probably 60% of my jobs started out. You'd hear the tones go off. ERS, no contact, 235. Clawson and Quincy. And we, you know, here we go. And we get on the apron. And, you know, the rig would pull out. And as the rig's pulling out, you'd hear the tones going off again. That was for the battalion. Yeah, right. They're the filling it out. Yeah. With us. And we'd get on the rig. And this is exactly how you, I mean, you'd hear, beep, calling 235, box is being transmitted. Uh, we have an address now, uh, 340. Oh, uh, my God. I'm getting excited just hearing uh, you. <laughs> Keep you know, going. Keep going. But, but in the background, what you would hear is the phone uh, ringing. fire department, yeah, the fire, ringing. fire department, fire department, fire department, the fire. So now you're like, you know, and then you hear, call on the 5 7 battalion. We're loading you up. 3 Again, 2 to rescue. Two, rescue in the squad. Uh, numerous phone calls. Uh, you know, what the hell is then, more exciting than that, man? There ain't nothing George more exciting Munch, than if that. If it was George Munch or Warren, you'd hear. Uh, two thirty-five. Pull your boots up. You're going to You're work. going to work. I love it. And and then what was funny is like we'd pull in. You're, you 
we couldn't hear our own company given the 1075. Like, you know, so the boss would get on the radio. Right, right, right. You bang, you hit the glass or whatever. Right, you'd hit that bam, 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 bam. But you couldn't hear your own company given the 235, the Brooklyn Urgent. All you'd hear is 10 4 235, put 1075, you know, 3971. Right. And, um, and that was actually so. I love it. Um, I guess I had, I got there in um, June of 91. It was probably that October. I get Tommy Richardson. Gives me the, he, Another he guy. just got there. Yeah. No fire. Oh, yeah. You're yeah. going to listen to what I, he has what? to say? Yeah. Oh, <laughs> after I tell the story, I'll tell you my line of office Holy is Christ. And how blessed I was. So. Tommy Richardson's the lieutenant, and I get the nozzle. And uh, that's, I mean, just that's exactly how it, you know, ERS, no contact. It was 3971, Clawson and uh, Quincy. And we pull up, and it's a vacant bar on the first floor, three-story brick, corner building, vacant bar on the first floor, blowing out the bar, auto-exposing into the second floor, and there's kids at the third floor window. So... I stretched two and a half, and uh, I, I had the nozzle. Uh, John Iberg is backing me up, and Brian Muldoon, I believe, is behind him. And he had a uh, he, he he. I backed him up for my first fire. Um, so we 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 get to the uh, to the entrance, and I go to Richardson. I go, Hey Lou, you want me to hit it from out here? He goes, No, bro, no, bro. Come on, bro. He's talking <laughs> me through. He goes, no, bro. Let's go, bro. We're going in. So, uh, that and sounds I, like La Femina. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Or, or, or Philly Saravino. Right? Oh, Saravino, Chief Bro. Come yeah. on, bro. Chief this bro. is Disney World over so, here, bro. Come on. Bro, 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 bro. Mm -hmm. So I go in, and I, I get in the first room, and I'm hitting it and um, moving to the second. What they did was they, they cut holes in the floor on the bar, and they poured gasoline in. So the gasoline fell down. So the basement's going now, too. 280 had the line in the basement. And uh, moving in, and John Iberg falls into a hole. So I shut the line down, and I go to pick him up. And I must have gone from, like, you know, being down here, maybe 500 degrees to almost like 1,000. I felt it right away, right along the, you know, the mask line. I was burned, right? So we get him out. We continue. Our bottles go. Go back out. Replace the bottles. 210 had the line. We go back and we replace, um, you know, we, we take the line from two, uh, 210 and we put the fire out. I'm burned. I got like my first, second degree burns along both sides. And um, John Iberg's burned. Gancy's the chief. Pete Gancy's the battalion chief. I was in on a ski house with his two sons. He looks at the burns and goes, Oh, you're going to have a great ski season now. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, we didn't miss and, that. and me and John Iberg went up to the burn center. And uh, I think they admitted him for a day or two because he had some burns on his legs. Uh, but I was sent home. Uh, you know, and I had to, you know, I walked into the bar with the badge of courage. Yeah, know, yeah. You got the little the silver, put the silver shit. stuff on it. Yeah, yeah, on it. You got it. The, yeah, uh, silver shit on you know. it. Right. <laughs> Whatever that silver stuff was. So, uh, silver dime. Silver dime. Yeah. Um, but yes, yeah, so um, Tommy Richardson got me burned at my first night. <laughs> <laughs> come on, kid. It's we got to go inside, come on, kid. bro. Come on. That's that was come the on, best. Bro. No, bro. Let's go, bro. Come I on, love bro. it. That's and, great. Uh, so, when you know the five to ten year period in the fire department, you, know, you read my mind, I, I, I'm looking at it and saying, I think he's going here next. He must be reading my mind, bro. I, I call this the terrible teens. Your five to ten year period when you you think you know it all. No, oh my God, word for word, but bro. you don't. Word for word, you get complacent. You think you're better than you are. Keep going. Yep, you got. And plus, I'm in two thirty five. Come on, no yeah. one's better than two thirty five. Yeah. So I'm working. It's a Friday night, and uh, it, I am. It was nineteen ninety five, and I'm I'm terrible teams. So. We have a covering yeah. officer. Guy just gets made out of uh, Lower Manhattan. So he comes in the fire. Says, hey, Lou, how you doing? You know, let me get you all set up and everything. I, you know, put, set us all his gear up and everything. I go, where are you from? And he tells me where he's from. I go, all right, yeah, great. All right. 
Um, you know, office up there, come on the back and everything. We'll have a nice meal. I march into the kitchen and I go, we're on our own tonight. <laughs> this guy just got made out of so-and-so in a lower, you know, lower Manhattan. And, um, you know, we have a pretty basic 2.35 night. <clears throat> Six o'clock in the morning. We go to Franklin. Actually, I do have the address. Hold on. Um, 727 Prospect Place. Report of a building fire. Six o'clock in the morning, right? So we pull up to a four-story uh, brick. Uh, two apartments per floor, front to rear. I thought it was a vacant building when we pulled up. That's how much fire there was. And it was right where... Remember where second do helped first do? That that whole thing started where the second do would help the first do get the line in place. So 249 second do. And um, there's fire everywhere. I mean, there's, there's people at every window. The place, I mean, there's smoke coming out of every orifice of this building. And so 280 starts the first line. Uh, Richard D. Padova is the chief in the 5-7. And um, 249 tries to get the second line. Um, this guy, Nicky, something is he, he's a lieutenant 277, little guy, big runner. Do you know? Uh, I don't know him, no. All right, he Maybe, was if you say his name, I probably would know him. Yeah, um, he goes to get the second line. Uh, our nozzleman, uh, Ray Creed, goes, Nicky, he goes, Your second do help with the first two line, and literally picks him off the back step where his feet are going like this <laughs> as and puts him down. Right, he grabs the second line. So I have I have the door. So um, Ray's stretching the line up the second floor. Mike Mulligan's backing him up. I got the um, door, and we have this newly promoted lieutenant from a lower Manhattan engine company. And Ray is like a robot. We hit the fire was on. Uh, it was auto exposing up. It was on the exposure two side those apartments. So the apartment, uh, you know, two on the on the exposure two sides roaring. He goes right through that it's third floor, right through that. Now he's burnt. He hands Mike Mulligan the nozzle. He goes downstairs. So it's the, we're on the top floor. It's me. All right, I'm backing up Mike Mulligan and this lieutenant from newly made lieutenant, and we're going down the hallway. And both, I mean, our Bible has been going off since pretty much the end of the second floor. And we're almost out of air. And this lieutenant takes his mask off and goes, come on, we can do this. I got half a bottle left. We can put this fire out. Let's go. <laughs> the same guy that I thought we were on our own for is willing to share his mask. So anyway, we, we, we continue down the hallway. Things you remember about over. certain jobs, right? <clears throat> Chief Pinova gets on the radio, goes, 235, you don't have it. This lieutenant gets, hey, chief, I think we got it. I think we got it. 235, you don't have it. We get back down in the street. We didn't have the whole roof. was like, a yeah, it's gone. Yeah. Right. Ripping big time. Um, <laughs> so, but I never doubted or judged where a guy worked after that. This guy, he, hmm. you know, he was ready to go, go to hell and back. He went, he yeah, went I like to get it. The job done. And here was I being a head back. Ah, this guy worked, you know. I'm in Bill, that's a great point, man. That's a great point. Because you know, what, ha what happens is, don't, what's a guy comes into the house, what's the first two things you ask him? You right? ask him where he worked. Where he worked. How, he has how much time you got? Where'd you work? That's it. You don't, you know, that's that, that's what we care about. And like you said, that five to ten year, you're judging everything mm -hmm. based on what you yeah. think is, is the shit, right? Right, right. So what was real interesting, other than that, so that was a learning lesson for me that I've told junior guys throughout my whole career. Never judge where a guy works. Like it. You can have a guy that's wearing that salty front piece from a busy Yeah, country. that's it, bro. That's, uh, 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 you know? Not so good, right. Um, Only thinking of himself. <laughs> yes. Another, uh, another part of the story was while we were moving up the stairs, going uh, second, third, fourth floor. I mean, Ray Creed being a, a robot. He really was. He was amazing. Um, there's a roof rope rescue going on in the rear. Uh, Jerry Triglia from 132 Truck, he ended up getting the James Gordon Bennett yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. from this fire. So <clears throat> he, they're setting up on the roof. And while they're setting up, 113 Truck, exposure two is a lot. They're trying to get their rig in 
and get the aerial up to the uh, top floor rear to try to steal the medal from Jerry. Because, you know, how we all, you know, competition, 113, 132, 123. So Jerry goes over and gets this uh, woman from the top floor. She actually, he, he actually thought she jumped because she was at the window and then went back in the apartment. And he might have even had to go in and grab her. Like she was like un unconscious and gets lowered to the ground and <clears throat> she comes back to life amazingly. And uh, so she comes back. So Jerry makes this great grab. Um, the woman he rescued goes up to the chauffeur of 280 and asks for a couple of dollars. Goes down to the corner, <laughs> corner goes down to the corner bodega. Gets herself a 40 of Ballantine Ale. It doesn't bite Jerry one. I mean, at least bite Jerry one. He just saved the life. I thought you yeah. said he was going to buy I thought she was going to buy him one. I thought that's what you were going no, to say. No, the chauffeur. The sh she asked the chauffeur, hey, you got a couple of dollars on you? And she goes down to the corner and buys herself a bottle of Ballantine Ale. And she's mm. drinking it. As, yeah. Like, you know, Jerry's on the side there. And oh, my God. That's freaking awesome. Yeah, it was. Uh, I don't believe it. I don't yeah. think that could ever happen. Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah, uh, yeah, not not in Brooklyn, absolutely not, yeah. not in Brooklyn. So what makes you decide uh, to go to uh, one eleven, though, bro? You know, you think you had a I, engine, or yeah, I I and it was probably one of the toughest moves I made. I mean, I love two thirty five. You know, a single engine is such a tight family. I mean, I had the Chiefs I had in the five seven. I had. Harry Rogers, Pete Gancy, Richie DiPadova, and Dennis Cross. You know, I mean, Rod O'Connor, Audie Sullivan. It was just, I mean, the senior guys I had in the company. You know, my buddy Tony DeRubio. Single house is real tough. But what actually asked, um, I had a couple of guys. Uh, actually, it was John Weishite goes, uh, you know, we're looking for some guys in Rescue 4. So this was like 1997. And I said, John, I would love to go there, but I really think I should go to a truck first. And um, I went to 111. And I was right in the neighborhood. And uh, it was, I could not have picked a better house to work in for learning the job. And I was absolutely honored to go there. And everyone in the house, Everyone was there to teach, but there were Pete, two names that I. Pete, we have some more pictures two, of 235. Go ahead, uh, Bill. I'm sorry. We have but, one more um, picture of 235. This is it. Go ahead. That is uh, Tompkins and Fulton, and Teddy Jankowski is the boss. That's me right next to him. Uh, Phil Scarpe is on the one side. Uh, Pete Barbagallo, Richie Colabella, uh, uh, Eckberg, he was on rotation. And Dennis Hargett is the one holding the mask. Um, yeah, that was like a fourth alarm on in frames on Tompkins and Fulton. And the only thing that stopped that fire was Tompkins Avenue. Hmm. It would have just kept on going. That's how much fire there was. And, uh, you know, that's why they have avenues as fire stops. Fucking but, uh, <laughs> Yeah. I mean, look, I mean, uh, look at the old Mac. Uh, what That's 111's rig there, the old Mac. Um uh, hmm. You know, um, but so going to, you know, before I um, talk about 111, you know, the Chiefs in the 5-7 were absolutely amazing. And um, Dennis Cross in particular was a very close friend of mine. And, uh, you know, we lost him on 9-11. And um, he just, he, there's a video of him as a lieutenant in 102 truck from like 1975 and in the video they go so lieutenant cross do you ever get scared he goes no the only thing that scares me is if i can't get to someone in time and that was what dennis cross was all about and he was just uh i mean how blessed was i to work with these guys guys Guys, you know, he was a 105 truck during the war years. Harry Rogers, 105 truck during the war years. Audie Sullivan, 132 truck. Richie DiPadova, 
2811. These guys, and this is what I walked into. Hmm. And uh, a great uh, Dennis Cross story. He asked me and another one of my lieutenants, Bob Sweeney, he, he asked us to go sailing with him. And we go out and I go, hey, chief, I'll, uh, how about I bring the cooler of beer? He goes, no, I got it. I go, I'll bring the sandwich. He goes, no, I got it. So me, Bob Sweeney, go out on Dennis Cross's sailboat out of like Sayville. And we're going to sail over to Fire Island and, uh, you know, enjoy a day out. He has a playmate with six Heinekens for three <laughs> of us for like five hours. <laughs> I'm like, oh, oh. Cramped up on I, you, did he? I, I was like savoring my beer. That's great, man. That's and, great. Uh, and I mean, we had a great day with uh, that's the way you're you like this. Right, exactly. I'm savoring, you know, but that's, that's what Dennis was. And, um, you know, we had a great day out there and uh, we went back. I think me and Sweeney went out for uh sorry, take care, Chief. See you later. We sat to the nearest ball we can get when we got back. But um, uh, you know, legends like that and two thirty five Monroe Street, you know, two thirty five to five seven battalion, so many great guys came out of there. And um, you know, like Vinny Ungaro. So I say no more. Mm -hmm. right? I mean, um one eleven firefighter. Captain, you know, 288 lieutenant and the captain of 235. And um, I was actually just away skiing up in Okemo. Um, I just passed by from, today. <laughs> That's I, I was with guys from 235. And uh, a great, great story about um, Steve Bates was a uh, firefighter in 214, went up to 69 engine, came a lieutenant, went to 235. And uh, unfortunately, he was killed in the Trade Center. He was best friends with Mike Donovan. Mike Donovan, 111 firefighter, 290, yep. lieutenant, mm -hmm. and captain of squad 18. Well, Steve Bates had no family. He dies. Guess who his beneficiary is? Mike Donovan. So Mike's like, what are I going to do? I, you know, what are we going to do with this? All this money oh, that's coming shit. in. So what does Mike Donovan do? I mean, Mike Donovan, talented carpenter, amazing. He builds a five-bedroom ski house in Okemo. I know he's a big skier, right? He worked for he was the ski yes. patrol or something. Yeah, I know that. I've seen him yes. up there. But he calls it Steve Bates Ski House in memory of Steve Bates. Oh, Steve Bates. For and he and he encourages <clears throat> companies to set up trips to go up there, bond with each other, ski. And keep Steve Bates. Wow, that's great. I like it. That's that's yeah. what the fire department's yeah. about. That's the family. So I was just I'm at a two thirty five. I don't know. I left there in nineteen ninety eight. I still get invited to go with these guys skiing, hmm. and we had a great time. I met all the young guys. The only guy that was on the trip, the last trip was kept uh, that I worked with was Kevin McBride. But you get to meet all the young guys. They love to hear your stories. I love to hear the, their stories. That's why it's a family. You know, I mean, well, no. I told I told you about this. I told you about the show, right? It's about you can go to a to a reunion and not see a guy for fifteen years, twenty mm -hmm. years, and it's as if not a day has gone by, right? It's yeah. like you've seen him yep. yesterday. That's the best Absolutely. part, and I'm sure the military is like you know we've talked about that before on the show, but that that's really like that's what family is, right? Where where you don't have to ever mm -hmm. feel un embarrassed, you don't feel uncomfortable. It's just smooth sailing. You know, that's the best part. Yes. Well, you know, sometimes we, you feel uncomfortable. You do? Well, yeah, when I, you're busting your balls. <laughs> <laughs> uncomfortable. Well, listen, Kev, it's when they stop busting your balls. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. You got to worry. Yeah. yeah. Good that's, point. Yeah. That is when, when you have to worry, you know. And um, I, uh, I was just talking, you know, you talk about family. And I had a buddy of mine from 235. Uh, he um, called me today, and um, Brian Clifford, and he ended up going uh, to 147. And um, his dad was a uh, lieutenant in the engine there. His brother and, was in my class. Yeah, 
He's got so, a lot of brothers, right? Doesn't he have like well, four brothers, four, four brothers. brothers. On the job. One, one of them is in one eighteen. One of them is in one seventy five. Two seventeen. Two seventeen. One. Two seventeen. One of them, the one I was with, came on with. <clears throat> anyway, for Hank's last tour, his whole entire company was made up of his sons. I love it. How awesome. Yeah, yeah. That's happened a few times. I know that's happened a few yeah. times where guys got to do that. I, yeah. I know with, uh, with, with, with the Higgins brothers, I'm sure, you know, with the. Uh, yeah, the guy from, brother, uh, I think the guy from 138. One of the guys from 138. Yes, that's right. right. That's he right. had his sons, guy from 155, a couple of the companies. Uh, I don't remember the name, but uh, yeah. I remember that. Mike but, Pryor. You know, it just, that was big it just shows. Sorry, bro. It just shows the tradition on the job, and I mean, how great did Hank feel when his last tour? He looks. At oh him. yeah, it's good stuff, man. Yeah, probably probably gave his wife like you know she's probably nervous as you know. Pryor, it was um, Pryor Coops. <clears throat> I actually. Um, I was, I was able to work with my father. Um, I was just going to ask you that, man. I worked with him in. Um, okay. uh, he was in one twenty four as a captain when I was in two thirty five, and um, I worked with him a couple of times over there. My mom was nervous, obviously, um, but he ABC'd a lot in the five seven, and there was this one particular day. It's a Sunday. He ABCs. We cook his favorite uh, lunch pork cut the parmesan hmm. and then we get a job on that we're third due at and it was um washington where underhill and washington meet right at atlantic avenue and it was a vacant building and we're third due so eight um 80s first due 19 second due we're third due and my father he knew he needed 105 supply so he was his plan was he had to tell us you know you got to supply 105 and he, you know, he told me later, he, like he felt bad doing that because we just cooked him this great meal. So we kind of figured that 105 had to be supplied, but we wanted to get a piece of the action. So two of us are stretching the three and a half down the street, and two of us have an inch and three quarter. And my father looks and goes, "You just made my job easy. Hook up that to uh, to 105 truck, and I need a line up in that uh, top floor there. Go for nice. it. Nice. And you know." And he told me that later that, like, you know, he, was, he didn't want to give us that, but, you know, because we cooked this great meal. So uh, we didn't have to have him make that decision. How he knows how to do it, bro. How he knows how to do it. No, it's so, um, so now 111 truck. Um, Bill, I don't want to get you a little, you know, rushed, but we got, we're, we're getting close. So I want you to move. Uh, how much time we got? How much time? Yeah. Well, you know, we can go to two and a half, but we're at, Let's we're at like one. I just want to make sure you got it. I'm, I'm watching. We're at 150. All right, 10 to um, And we got to, we got two and a half, right? Yeah, yeah, we can go to two and a half. Okay. All right, great. So, 111 truck, two names. I mean, everyone was great. But Eric Wiener, Greg Seminara. Could I, could I ask for I mean, what are you kidding me? better mentors and on both, like, both sides of the food chain? I mean, just... You know, Eric intensed. He, he he got a medal every year. He was in the medal day book every year. Every year. Yeah. Every year. Every year. Like he every got, year. When I was a kid. On a detail too, right? <laughs> Didn't he get a one on a detail? He got detailed somewhere. He did 283. He yeah. was in 283 engine and he ran through the project to get to a woman hanging out a window and ran back through. And like his whole coat, pretty much like incinerated. Every every time I saw his name on there, I'm like, "Who the hell is this guy? Like, who is he?" Mm -hmm. I mean, now I know. So, but... Eric, um, he taught us how he coached football. Eric was a coach at Tottenville High School, and that's how he taught us. I mean, it was tough love. He would have in the afternoon. We'd go. We'd have we'd take out both saws, force plunger saw, and the roof saw. And he, like me and like, say, Chris Iser or, uh, you know, Sky Sivet, he would have us, all right, let's go. I'm going to time you. Who could change the blade faster? And it was like, it was like an Olympics. It was great. You know, well, who could tie the bowline and the bite faster? You know, and close your eyes. You might not be able to see visibility. Let's see if you do it in the smoke. You know, my first, I'm there a week. 
and we get a uh, second alarm in a limestone type brownstone on Halsey and uh, right off of Bushwick Avenue. And as we're getting there, uh, this guy, Robbie Roscoe, he made a grab, he's pulling this woman down uh, from the parlor floor. And they tell us, 111, go in there, relieve 124. And I remember I'm pulling ceilings. And, you know, you get tired. Like, and Eric goes, what? You're stopping? Hey, guys. <laughs> You signed up for this. You signed up for this mission. There's only two ways out of here. Either you pass out or you get the job done. And I'm like, what the fuck did I just sign up for? And uh, that's the way he was. He he was like that, but he, he taught you in a way that just, um, if he liked you, that was the thing. If he, if he felt he was wasting his time. Really, yeah. You know, he would just, you know, um, I don't think he called me Bill for six months. It was Carlson. Carlson, Carlson, get the hook there. Get the hook there. You know, and then when Carlson, the F are you doing down there? Me Bill, you know, I mean, um, yeah. That's good. I mean, Who were the bosses um, there, Bill, when you got there? Um, the captain was Joe Mulligan. Um, I had Patty Cannon, Steve Luisi, and uh, Canio. Um, and um, then I had um, Chris. Uh, Chris was a lieutenant after that. And um, who else went over there? Uh, we we lost Chris Sullivan on uh, 9/11. He was working did a last minute mutual in the in the uh, in the engine. Uh, he was great. I mean. But he would, uh, we go through the writing list. And, you know, once you learn the can and the irons, what do you get? You get in the room for two years. And he used to read the writing <laughs> list and go, Carlson. And he just look up like roof. that. Or you had the roof. You know, had the roof. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, Chris Sullivan was awesome. Um, you know, Luisi, Luisi taught me things, uh, you know, how to overhaul with a hook, you know, with a fluted hook. You know, but Eric was just, uh, I mean, life-saving rope. Halfway, pass off, invert bag, step on the hook, substantial object knock, clip in four turns. Right. That's it. In your sleep, you could do it. Mm. Absolutely. And he would. He would, like, 9 o'clock in the morning, he'd put you on the spot in the kitchen. You know, you got your point, your cup of coffee. Hey, Carlson, what, give me the seven steps to the life-saving rope. Humming, 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 you know. Ed Norton. You would do it. You would do it. And uh, he, he was just uh, absolutely awesome. And Greg Seminara, a lot more laid back. But um, Greg taught me. Oh, a great uh, Eric Weenel line before I go to uh, Greg Seminara. You know when you get the OV and, you know, that's the, the position that you're a little confused about. You got to think. This is, right. He goes, Billy, he goes, when you got to the truck, can and irons, can and irons. So you know where the can and irons are going. You're the OV. Just go opposite them. And it made things so simple. He goes, you know what? He's absolutely right. You know? I mean, and it was great. I mean, yes, 111, um, we get a brownstone. And this, we would, you know, when we, we the conventional trucks around us knew that brownstone, no matter where the fire was, Top floor dead man's room with the bucket right up to the top floor dead man's room. And it was amazing how many, uh, you know, lives we we found. You know, we, we'd find uh, civilians up there and make grips. And uh, so that was kind of, uh, that was SOP for 111. Top floor dead man's room was most of our area was brownstones. And um, that's why 111 consistently stayed busy. Because with brownstones, you might have a fire to hold insides. You know, burnt up, but they're gonna repair it. Like up in Bushwick, you know, things quieted down a bit because it was row frames, and the row frames they burn, they burn down, and they were just vacant lots. You know, Bushwick really didn't have that many vacant lots. It was the brownstones they would just renovate again. Um, but Greg Seminera was on the a little bit more laid back, and uh, just awesome. And I remember, you know, him. One of the best things he taught me about the OV is you get to the OV, 
And if you got smoke, you can see smoke in that window. You take that window because you may find someone in there and you're doing a better, you know, you're saving their lives. Bad thing, you let the smoke go out and you might get them. If there's fire there, anyone in that room's dead. Then you hold off until they stretch the line and get water on the fire. And uh, it makes sense. Um, Greg Seminera was a fireman at 230 engine. And he tells a story about a guy, Nicky Rocco. Um, Nicky Rocco was a local skull who lived in firehouses. Hey, Rocco. He pissed off. All right, Rocco. He pissed off one firehouse <clears throat> and he'd go to the next. So he's, I guess, doing his time at 230 engine and he's getting a job at the Board of Education. So he tells Greg Seminara, Sammy, I got to be up at five in the morning. I got this job with the board of Ed I'm starting, and I got to be out there at seven o'clock in the morning. Now it's probably 10 degrees out. And Sammy goes, I got it. No problem, Nikki. I'll wake you up at five. Um, Nikki goes to sleep, and Greg goes around the whole entire firehouse and turns all the clocks three hours fast. <laughs> so what looks like five Sorry, o'clock in the morning, it's two o'clock in the morning. And Greg goes, Nikki, wake up. You gotta you gotta be out in Jamaica. Let's go. Come on. So Nikki gets on the on the bus and he, he doesn't realize why there's nobody else on the bus. He's like the only one on the bus. And he gets down to Jamaica and he realizes he goes, it's like 3 30 in the morning. He calls Sammy up and goes, Sammy, I'm going to kill you. I'm going to kill you. And he's standing in the middle of Hillside Avenue at 3.30 in the morning, freezing his balls off. Um, Bill. But, yes. I just We just got a, a, a message in the chat. You had to know Billy would go to full 2.30. Passionate as always. All the best, Billy. Rico. Uh, Rico, absolutely. Absolutely. Percy, he got promoted. Did he get promoted? Yes, he did. Rico is a lieutenant out in Queens now. And uh, awesome. Uh, so much fun, always laughing. And uh, we all have to go to play. full. He could probably go to the full 232 when he retires. You know what I mean? He's uh, he don't uh, he's not too short on the words either, is he? No, no. no <laughs> <laughs> but um, he could jibber jabber with the best of them. <laughs> what's funny about Rico is Rico everyone in, everyone in squad one. Had to be a member of the Colombian Association. Right, right. I'm right. Swedish and German. He was always and he's on the board. He got yes, me a so few times. I know that. Squad. Yeah, yeah. He always exactly. he's like, Lou, you're Italian. What are you doing? You got to yeah. get in. But I'll tell you what. I go to the meetings in the, the meetings. They eat good, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, that was like my wife. We go, um, we go to the Emerald Society dinner, and you know the food's mediocre and everything, and uh, you know, but then we we go to Russo's for the. Colombian Association dinner. I mean, the, I mean, the, you know, the, the happy hour beforehand, amazing, right? There's some busboy pouring her Jamesons, and I think the whole night she had like a salad. If not, I'm like, holy, holy, you got to mix up. You should have done that at the Emerald Society dinner, not the Colombian Association dinner. You, it's you a Don Juan Parmesan. Right? You got to eat good over here. You know what I mean? Come exactly. on, what are you talking you about? Your, uh, but uh, no. Um, Rico's great, uh, absolutely. So, where were we? Paletti. The 111, fantastic. Learned so much. But it was so you only did all the time there, right? I uh, I was there. Two I was going to catch up. Catch up. He's catching up. 98 to 2001. Nice. Yes, I I'll, I went. Uh, I left there in December of 2001, but um. Obviously, I had my doctor stay there, and um, I I was in Bay Ridge, and <clears throat> the first tower collapsed. I was on the um, Gowanus, and we get to the firehouse, and we knew 214 was already there, and a bunch of us, we, we get our way down to the Brooklyn Bridge, uh, you know, with our gear, and the second tower had just collapsed, and... We commandeered a flatbed truck and a bunch of us from 214 and 111 are going over to Brooklyn Bridge on a, on a flatbed truck. And we get to the 
um, Manhattan side. And as we're going over the bridge, there's people coming across the Brooklyn Bridge, totally dusted, totally just, you know. And um, we um, get over the Brooklyn Bridge in Manhattan. And first thing I do is on Park Row, Weinstein's Hardware. I go in there. There's an old Jewish guy. And I go, sir, we're pretty much going to loot your store. And we took shovels. We took 95 masks. You know, everything that we think we could use, because we figured we we're going to go in the pile and save people. And he, I remember he goes, take what you want. Don't worry. I actually went back there a year later with my wife or my girlfriend at the time. And I said, you know, do you remember me? He goes, oh, I remember you. And the city did me well. Mm -hmm. And he, yes, he got reimbursed on everything. So we went and we went on the um, north side. And we're coming down Bessie Street. And my followers were in detail in the 13th division, and they, they responded. And I run into my father, and I'm with guys from 214 and 111. And I go, Dad, Dad, I'm glad I saw you. You know, where do you need us? What do you need us to do? He goes, Bill, nobody's going on that pile until that building falls. And he's pointing the building. Seven. Yes, seven. Yep. It, yep. it had the huge chunk taken out of it. And... I go, Dad. I was fully involved on. by the time. Uh, yeah. Well, building seven, what, building five, those little 12 stories. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't think building, building seven just had a chunk taken out of it. That was that was the other big high rise that fell at like five o'clock. Yeah. So I go, Dad, I go, what do you mean we can't, like, you know, all our friends are here. We got to get on there and get to our friends. He goes, we're not going to lose any more. And I remember going to him, okay, chief. I was so pissed at him. And I went back, and at that time, they, I hear on the radio, they're calling for a, a tower ladder in front of Building 5, which was a, one of those 12-story buildings, fully involved. And I look, and there's 124's rig. Now, my father being the captain of 124 for 10 years, my mother was always known as the first lady of 124 and she passed <laughs> in 2000 of brain cancer oh, and they were able to get relocated that day to queens and 124's rig was in my mother's funeral possession so i knew i was going to be all right and me and bobby austin get in 124's rig i get on manhattan and uh you know i didn't know what to call it i called 9 11 i said like you know recall to um you know, or FDNY recall to Manhattan. I have 124's rig. We're going to bring it down towards building five. And we had no water source when we got down there. And we ended up hooking <clears throat> into Century 21's main fed system, that first floor standpipe. And we got water from there, stretching into 227's rig. And we got water in, one, in 124's bucket. We were only... I think we were up and running about 10 minutes and they pulled us off. But there was a captain, a 33 engine. Um, he comes up and goes, who's running the show here? I go, I guess I am. He goes, Battlefield Commission, Lieutenant. So I saw him about a year later. I'm like, hey, uh, whatever happened to that? Uh, Where's I the check? I yeah. need the Little check. Bring <laughs> yeah. yeah. um, the bars. Give me the check. Yeah, but that's just, uh, you know, and then, you know, I guess uh, five o'clock building uh, seven fell. And uh, they still didn't really let us on the pile, even that whole uh, night for the most part. No. They were. <clears throat> no. And uh, my, my father saved our life, you know, and uh, it was, um, you know, so I go to Fort Truck. In, uh, Wait, before you go to Fort Truck, I got a more important question. Yeah. Yes. You, you and Bobby Austin in the same car. Holy shit, who got the word in edgewise in that car? No, I didn't. Holy shit. He had a cigarette in his mouth, and he's going, hey, kid, you know how to drive this thing, kid? You know how to drive this big red machine? No, Bobby was great, Bob. You know great Bobby uh, tip was, hey, kid, in the summertime, the shaft fires, all the windows are open. That's when you're going to get your good jobs. This fire would come yeah, up. Yeah, it goes up the shaft and goes into every apartment. It, right? it go, goes in every apartment. Nice. Um, All right, so get back so, to your question. Why did you, what happened, makes you go to a lot of four? I had, between the cops and the fire department, 15 years 
in um, pretty much a three square mile area. I always was interested in Manhattan and I figured what better time to go than after September 11th when particularly Manhattan lost. Yeah, they got, they had no manpower. (laughs) Yeah. I I went to Ford truck. uh, They lost 15 guys. Holy Christ. And, and I saw a total um, other side of the job and um, help, help to rebuild, um, you know, the fire department. And Ford Truck always had a great reputation. Yeah, they do have a good uh, reputation. Yeah. They're right in the middle there. But that, they get all the people coming to the firehouse all the time, right? It's a pain oh, in the dick. It was, it was crazy. Absolutely crazy. Oh, after 9-11, it was probably insanity, yeah. right? It really was. It was. Um, but I I met, I mean, the chiefs there, Charlie Williams, Joe Nardone. <laughs> I mean, these guys were legends on the job. And. And I really did see a, another part of uh, the fire department. You know, it's uh, those are tough fire. fires, man. No doubt. Well, well, and they all have names. Notice that they all have names. Yeah, the street, whatever uh, street they're on, or exact Macaulay. Cole. Whatever building they are, right? Exactly. Still, still. 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 Um, <laughs> That's so funny. Yeah. My, I guess to put Ford Truck in perspective, my first New Year's <laughs> Eve, I worked. Uh, and I had the irons, and over the night tour, we go to a real nasty food on the stove in a tenement on Ninth Avenue that I would put up. I compare it to any shitty tenement uh, in East New York on, you know, Logan Street. I mean, it was just, you know, I mean, bad. We go from there. We go to a high rise 1077 on the east side which is a pretty decent job. And then we have a mattress fire in the Plaza Hotel. I mean, talk about going. Damn it. <laughs> in the toilet. Fire. You're in the toilet. To the fucking, hotel. The I mean, gold, gold uh, soap hole handles. Yeah. <laughs> you know, um, that's so, funny. and I'm watching the time, gentlemen. All right. You got me till 1030. I got to, right? Wow. Well, before we got to get to the old school tip of the day. Right. Yeah, we got to wrap you about 1020, bud. All right. Okay. So, what truck? My it had to be April, and we get a uh, phone alarm. So it was like a nice Sunday morning, and we get a phone alarm for a fire on Seventh Avenue and Fifty Fourth Street, and we're pulling down the street, and it's a um, one of those twelve-story class two buildings. You don't know that they're like fireproof, non-fireproof. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Fire protected. Fire is, exactly. Fire protected. Fire is blown out two windows on the second floor. I got the old beat. Take the portable out. And uh, guy Bob Schuff and uh, Keith Kern, who unfortunately passed away, they helped me. They raised the up. <clears throat> and I start up the portable. And I take the window. Now it's 1030 on a Sunday in, um, in the spring. I look across the street. There's got to be 300 people tourists from all over the world taking <laughs> my watch picture. your picture <laughs> yeah so I, I took the window i look at them i wave mm-hmm. it was like the roar of yankee stadium <laughs> <laughs> and i feel like it just hit a home run yeah. <laughs> where they were cheering and i went in the window and and did what i had to do and uh and that was manhattan manhattan was uh you're uh, always in the limelight there, right? I mean, uh, it's good, good and bad. And probably. that fun house, too, man. Holy good shit. and bad. Oh, yeah. Um, and you know what? I'm friends uh, with so many there. So many. And uh, I failed uh, 2007 lieutenant's test by two points. So I'm like, oh, place is great. But the running was getting to me. And Oh, yeah. And I said, I, you know, I got to do something just to reinvent myself. And that's when I knocked on the door of Union Street. And uh, man, did I reinvent? Probably one of the best work to to run ratios on the job, right? I mean, they taught me so much. I thought I knew it all. Nope. And um, it was great. I mean, I always say, uh, working in squad one, uh, we we ate us ate away through the barrel. I mean, you got project fire. Oh yeah. You can eat anywhere, right? Yeah. Yep. You go to Dyker Heights. You go to Ellen. You guys went to Staten Italy, for God's sake. You could go eat over there uh, on some jobs, right? 
we go Red Hook, you go to DeFonte's, get yourself a potato and egg sandwich. Yeah. Um, it was great. And every single guy in squad one took the time out to teach me. And uh, the one guy I really have to uh, mention is Darren Jacobs. Because Darren, he was just so talented. And he would teach you in a way that if you if you didn't get it right and you let him down, he was like he was like really disappointed, like just truly disappointed. It was like like you just dis disappointed your professor. And um, and he just he was so happy when you got it right and that he was making an impact. And that's how all the guys were in squad one. Um you know, it was. Um, Who was the captain when you when you went to uh, talk to them? My whole time, the captain there was Jack Flatley, and uh, you know he uh, he took me over, and uh, I it really was amazing. Like I I'd be on that rig going to fires, and like this is awesome. This is what I've what a great way to end up my career. Yeah, no, it's a great uh, spot, man. Who's that? That's Mastro uh, there. Uh, oh, that's Mastro. Mastro Charlie Puza, Sheldon George, Sheldon, himself, the Viv, and the Viv. Uh, the Angelus. I think he, Viv was my probing. I think I'm pretty oh, sure. Awesome. Actually, uh, if you can see this, that is a gift. That's a squad one. Uh, yeah, yeah, I like it. Nice. That was a gift. That was a gift from Anthony Viverito on my retirement, and it has white claw in it right now. Yeah, yeah. Don't, don't tell you. the audience that. But oh. we also have to have some Jameson. You gotta, you oh. gotta cut it. Oh, the Jamos. Gary. Da -da. Da -da. So, one, I had great fires in Squad One, but um, probably my most tragic fire was also in Squad One. We we get reassigned. Uh, I think it was December of fifteen or sixteen. Uh, it was snowing out about 11 o'clock at night. We were on our way. I know which job you're talking about. And they redirect us to Bedford Avenue and uh, report of a uh, build a fire with kids trapped. <laughs> and um, it was in a, uh, a acidic area. It was during the Sabbath. And a woman and a daughter got out. But the mother wouldn't use the phone during the Sabbath to call 911. And seven uh, kids uh, perished in that fire. I remember, that. I remember myself and Todd Adams, um, when we get there, Sean Parker was the lieutenant and John Snow was the chief in the 3-3. And you hear in 10-45, 10-45. And he just, he grabs us. He goes, Sean, just get in there, do what you want. Supposedly there's kids all over the place. And um, me and um, uh, Todd went up the uh, uh, to a setback, went in. I remember the first kid that I found. I, I actually thought it was a piece of furniture. That's how badly burned he was. And um, just, you know, a horrible fire. And uh, I remember the next day the counseling unit came. And uh, they were great. And the one thing that you got to realize, I mean, we all see tragedy, is we didn't start these fires. We just do the best we can when we get there. And that was taught to me early on in my career. And... Uh, it helped me get me through my career. I didn't cause that fire. Uh, I can just do the best I can when I get there. And, uh, you know, um, but, you know, and you talk about it. You got to talk in the kitchen and make sure everyone's all right. And, you know, for the young guys, they're going to see stuff like this. Keep a check on each other. Know that the counseling unit's there if you need to talk to somebody. I'll tell you one thing. I, I like, I, I always felt when the counseling unit came to the firehouse, they were the old, FDNY guys, right? Like if it was some other guy from the city, some schnook, I wouldn't give two rats ass. But when, when the guys come and they show up and they're from, you know, old FDNY guys, they always got the respect from the guy, at least in my house, the guys, you know, again, they come quite quite often, whatever it is, yeah. once a quarter or something like that. They just say, you know, what's going on? This is what's happening in the job a little bit. They give you a little window of what's happening. But they were always very cool. And uh, I think their stuff stuck to some guys. You know, if they it was, needed it, it, it made it Absolutely. easy. It made it easy for them to come and pull them over to the side and say, "Hey, you know, you know, they right. were they were intimidated, but they saw that the older guys were coming, and it, it like really made it easy for them to, you know, hey, how do I get a little help if I uh, need something?" Yeah. Else? So, in 
December of 2009. Uh, <clears throat> my father was supposed to uh, be out at my um, my sister's house to watch my, uh, my two nephews. And uh, my sister calls me. He never came out. He was living on the Upper East Side on York Avenue and 72nd Street. So I... Um, I told my sister I'll go check on him. So I go and um, I go up to his apartment and uh, I find him in the bedroom. He had a heart attack. And uh, I mean, my father's my best friend. So I sat there for about, I I went in the kitchen. I I took, I got a beer, I popped it open. And I sat there just thinking about my dad for about a half an hour, just, game plan, you know, my plan of attack. I called my wife. I said, Paul, you know, my father passed. Uh, why don't you come into the city? I call um, my sister and they call for a truck. And, you know, word gets around how he calls him past. So I guess about seven o'clock that night, the ME office is finished, you know, and the cops are there. And they're taking my father down, you know, they're gonna, he has to go to the, you know, bring him to the morgue. And I walk out onto, out of the, uh, the, the apartment building. And 72nd Street's a dead end street. Every single company in the dead battalion on duty members. The 8th Battalion, 9th Battalion, Rescue one and four truck are lined up down the whole entire block with their helmets like this in honor of my father. And I went in the middle of the street and I said, this is a perfect example why this is the greatest job in the world. Amen. Yeah, man. And we are the greatest family in the world. So, Pete, as a closing, could you please play the video? I sure can. I'm pulling that up right now. Give me one moment here. I've been waiting for that video, Bill. Here it comes, guys. If the job wasn't fun, it wouldn't be worth it. But, uh, you know, I feel I'm blessed. I enjoy the job. I work with uh, work with good men. And uh, after 25 years, uh, it hasn't lost uh, the thrill. I guess uh, that's what makes firemen so special. The job is special to them, and it uh, it's reflected in everything they do. And uh, I'll, I'll always be proud to be a New York City fireman. And uh, we have memories that we'll never forget. Some of the best times in our lives were spent, uh, you know, either in the firehouse or on the field of battle, so to speak. And it's uh, things that could never compare. And it, and it's. It's really hard to explain it. It's it's hard. People from uh, other walks of life uh, probably wouldn't understand it, but uh, it's just the greatest job in the world. I mean that. Okay. Two six two seven one. No, any every guy could say that. Those words, exact, exact. Yeah. I mean, how many times have, we've been doing this for a year? It's mm. exact. You could have the same guy do the same thing. You know how he said it. He at the end, the last thing he says is, "It's just, it's it's just it's the greatest job in the world." Yeah, that's it, it man. You know, that's, it. Um, that's unfortunate. He but, he he retired in what two thousand and seven, and he passed a he couple years. He retired in two thousand seven. He passed in two thousand nine. Yeah, that's mm-hmm. the only thing. At, at his, but at his wake, you know, people came up and said, uh, "Aunt Billy, you know, I'm sorry your dad didn't enjoy his retirement." He didn't want to retire. No. He loved the job. Yeah. He loved the job. How did he how did uh, he get out? Did he age out or did he have something come up or I he aged out. He, aged he did out. age out. Yep. He went right to the end. No. Hey, listen, uh, man. <laughs> he did what he fucking wanted to do, man. Exactly. He did on his, uh, on his terms, man. Sign the papers, I, right? You do what you I want did to do. It my you. way. That's he it. Man. Way. Yeah. And uh right till the end. And he never uh, worked a day in his life, right? If you love yeah, what you exactly. Do. When you love what you do. So right. let's have a little toast to Howie. A little toast to that old J Mo Howie. Hey. hey. 
That's Billy, a, great, I can honestly, that's a way to end it, Bill. I can honestly say, Billy, that I have never met a family with a love or the passion for the job like you right down to your mother to just, you know, like you said, hand your father the phone. I've never met a family with more of a passion. Yeah, I didn't know any of that. Right I, mean, I always knew you were a little. You had so many yeah, I mean, my father, my brothers were on the job, too. And I'm looking yeah. at you guys. I'm like, these guys, like, would eat, sleep, breathe the fire department. Dude, make- I, could, I called him yesterday. I talked to him yesterday. He's like, I can't send the timeline yet. I'm at a fifth. Yeah. Like he's still doing it. He's still doing that. Yeah. Still I almost day. sweat. I, oh, all right. I didn't just, go, but it was. I did almost. I'm just like saying that. he's doing. I, he's still doing it, man. Yeah, you can't get it out of him. But that I was you know what? many I mean, levels of guys who love the job. But this this family and he's like, still doing shit with the burn set. He's he's doing the, yeah. the family transport and uh, I did a fire yeah. family transport the burn on uh, the burn center. He's still and, doing uh, it. The counseling unit, absolutely. And I'll never stop doing that. Yeah, this job has been this job has been great to me. I got to get back. That's great. Oh, that's Excellent. Blessed, great, great way to transition in with your dad and transition out with your dad, Billy. Really great job. Oh, thank you. And you know Pete, what time that brings oh, us Oh, Pete, to. I think it is that time, Pete. Well, you know what time it is, ladies and gentlemen. Oh, he's got more papers. Hold on. He's got hold on. Sheet, I like it. I'm waiting for this one. Yeah. If Pete, you guys it. are avid watchers of the show, you would now know that it's time for the old school tip. Of the day, day, day. Now I have several. Is that okay? Absolutely. All right. I don't know if any of you know Dennis Williams. Dennis Williams was a firefighter in 235, and he went to 113 truck. And in 1994, they got a uh, class three in a supermarket down like off of Rogers Avenue, uh, down by, uh, by the polo grounds. And they go into this supermarket, which was closed, but the door was open. And Dennis gets shot um, by, I guess, the security guard. And uh, he was all right. But something I learned from that is announce yourself as a firefighter. Even if it's you're going into a building on building inspection or if you're going in to a window as an OV, yell out, fire department. I had a job with Patty Deegan. They told they sent us to the exposure. I go into the basement, and there was this couple living in a basement apartment, and the guy had a gun. Thank God I yelled out, fire department. So always announce yourself, but you never know what people have on them. Um, water issues. This is one of my father's tips. Um, if you pull up and you can't get the rigging pumps, and you can't just, and it's ripping, and you got hydrogen pressure. That's 50 psi. It's not going to get you water up into like the 10th floor of a high rise, but in a PD or a brownstone, uh, it's going to get you enough water to at least get the job done until you get augmented. Um, 1045s come across a, a civilian that's burned in a fire apartment, and you're trying to pull them out. And this skin is hanging off. Get a bed sheet. Bed sheet's going to work. It's going to hold them. Unless, you know, they got it at Dollar General. Trust me, a bed sheet's going to work. And last but not least, gut feeling. If you're thinking about doing something in the firehouse and you kind of feel it's just not the right thing to do, it's probably not. <laughs> That's what I got. <laughs> Trust the gut, man. I must have Trust said that a thousand times. Trust the gut. And that's and that's mm-hmm. in, in fires too. You know, trust your gut, yeah. man. If if so if your body's telling you something ain't right, it's probably yeah. true, right? Yeah. Well, I like I like yep. the uh announcing yourself because you know I didn't I didn't really I mean I learned that because we used to do water leaks and stuff in, in a story when I was in 117. Um, but we really weren't afraid of getting shot there. But, uh, you know, for the most part, you know, guys did it. But when I went to 290-103, you know, you did it. Every time, everywhere. I, when I was walking in the front door, I was, you know, yelling that, you know, fire department, fire department. But that's a, that's a great tip because that's not written anywhere. <laughs> you know what I mean? That's, 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 uh, and, that's good uh, stuff. Oh, Paul, hold on. Before we go, Bill, we, had a, we got a picture with the chief, the big cheese, the big man, the big whiz. Oh. 
Come on, we got to get the. Uh, I know. I see this. Right. Which one is this? Oh, the I big man. You. What are you talking about? The, the Stand big kahuna. Stand by. It's coming. It's there you coming. go. The big kahuna. I like to call him. Right when I. Oh, I right did see when I thought. Yeah. Right when I thought I was done. My <laughs> school. My proby school buddy. No shit. In for some more fun. And uh, John Esposito is just such a great friend of mine. We were in proby school together. Um, he did a little bit better no than you, maybe. I was going to say. There, <laughs> is no, there is no doubt <laughs> that he's a hell of a lot smarter than me. <laughs> but yeah. I don't know who had more fun in their career. Agree. Touche. <laughs> Touche. Yeah, Touche. Uh, I know he's good uh, friends with uh, Nicky Corrado, too. 324, 18. Absolutely. It was good that it was good that he came in. He uh, he brought some good oh. life to uh, he brought some good I, stuff to it. So you know, I only my, hear good things last, from him. My last tour, we had the citywide, and uh, we went up to Rescue Three for lunch, Squad One for dinner, and when you have the citywide, you cover uh, nice. any um, any third alarm or above. And three o'clock in the morning, he knocks on the door. Billy, we got a third alarm, Lewis and Vernon. Do you know where that is? I got Lewis and Vernon. 111 trucks first do. 235s first doing the second. I think I can get a stand. Hang on. Turn it, <laughs> turn it into a fifth alarm. That's how I walked out the door. My last door, a fifth alarm fire. Wow, you- and, and 124 truck and 111 truck in front of the fire building. That was definitely my father. Wow. Nice. Oh, that, was, that, that was a yep. parting gift from my father. I don't think the guy that owned the one-story commercial appreciated it, but... We had fun. That was awesome. You got a lot of a lot of fans in the in the chat, Bill. Neil Mullane, yep. Joel Kanaski, you know, all the you know, uh all the guys once uh, FDNY. Well, that's guy. why that's why we're all family. I mean FDNY equals family. Yeah. No doubt, man. Good show, Bill. Thank you. It was a Bill, pleasure. Really- no I problem. enjoyed it. My pleasure. Yeah. Thank you for uh having me on and uh just uh cheers to everybody. Yeah, man. Great uh Great way also to bring your dad into it, bro. Really amazing. It was like we got we got two guys on tonight, bro. Not yeah, just I, one. I enjoyed bro. listening to, to yeah. the stories about him. Yeah, I did. Yeah. I mean, I heard about him my whole career. You know what I mean? I know that name my whole career, you know. He uh if it wasn't for me, who knows? I might have been a banker, right? You know, yeah. he exposed me to the job. <laughs> you know, I'm blessed. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and I definitely wouldn't have had as I much know about a banker. Maybe I love that you say that. Maybe a bank robber. Maybe I would have been a bank robber. I love that you say that as a negative. I, I might have been a banker, you know, <laughs> a homeless person, a banker, a total yeah, scumbag. Yeah. 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 I love yeah. it, brother. <laughs> That's how uh, I feel about it. Wearing a suit is not for me. Yeah. But wearing bad uh, sweatshirts definitely is. That There's is. No that, yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> right, Petey Boy, bring us out, bro. Give us a little shameless end plug. Well, ladies and germs, thank you all for tuning in. Thanks to everybody who oh, hit us up. Shameless. Also in the uh, Super Chats, which is our new feature, we really appreciate all of that love. But, guys, basic stuff that's all free. Cost you nothing. Head on over to iTunes Podcast, Spotify, or wherever fine audio podcasts are found. Free. And please hit the like, subscribe, and share button there, right? If you hit take that- booger hook. You, yeah, yeah. Take the booger hook off the bang switch and do it. Um, <laughs> and, and that's just on iTunes Podcast. Uh, podcast hey, I need to ask you, what exactly is the bang switch? Okay. The trigger of a gun is the bang switch. Uh, and the booger hook, is, is, it's obvious. Oh, uh, I don't understand the correlation, but great. I, I'm, I'm with it, bro. Yeah, whatever, okay. bro. We got, we got a manly yeah, audience. John, all that Chief, stuff. Chief Espo said he would never be a banker. Well, <laughs> that's what I'm saying. <laughs> all he right, looks like, uh, he looks like a good tailor. Go <laughs> <ask him>, tailor. <laughs> he does look like a tailor. Ladies yeah. and germs, if you're Girl, also sorry, watching us on youtube.com forward slash getting salty experience, uh, please definitely like, subscribe, and share there. Tell the YouTube algorithm, hey. We like this stuff. We want a mm-hmm. more. Okay. Also, head on over to <laughs> Instagram <laughs> at Salty Dog Inc. Where old. <laughs> at Lewis Refreno <laughs> is giving you the 
finest curated, saltiest fire photos at 2.39 a.m. get yourself a lucky strike. Morning and get yourself a lucky strike. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, and last but not least, guys, head on over to GettingSaltyApparel.com where you can support the show by buying all of the wonderful wares that we have. Apparel, T-shirts, hoodies, hats, uh, and all kinds of firefighter accessories. Uh, guys, also, if you have a question for the show for our Q&As, which will come back ultimately when you guys have some questions for the show, um, head on over to GettingSaltyExperience at gmail.com uh, and shoot us one there. Also, guys, one last thing. The Facebook group keeps growing, and we have a T-shirt that we have just produced for the nice Facebook roll group it is uh the getting salty fans on facebook alan shup happy birthday buddy he started the group um and uh we have nothing to do with the administration of that group but dang it we are proud that there is a community surrounding yep. this channel and ladies and gentlemen that is all we appreciate the boop, love boop. and the views thank you nice all right so i got a new email you gotta throw up, pete because we're starting a new segment so I want you guys to send in pictures of either your rig. If there's something interesting about it, you got a cool compartment, cool tool, whatever the hell it is. Also, if you guys have any fire photos that you've been to, don't give me some shit that you lifted off the internet. Mm -hmm. Send it to, ready for this, Pete? Kubes, K-U-B-E-S, podcast at gmail.com. So it's a new segment. I just uh, hit Ruffy to it a little bit this morning. So just send it there so it doesn't tie up. Rufus, you know how he loves to get extra email now. So <laughs> I didn't want to get the I did this like the last minute. I'm like, oh fuck, he's gonna shoot me the dirty look because I said send them over there. So I made my own stupid email. So Don't send me any emails want. about fire pictures. One. Send I'm it out. to me. Send it to me. Rigs. Oh, if you send me a fire picture on Instagram, I'm deleting it. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, if you're listening to this, that's Koob's K U B E S podcast at gmail dot Send them. Send them for the new segment. All right. That's Billy, it. thank you, brother. Excellent, 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 excellent. My thank pleasure, you. and it was just – I had a lot of fun on the show. Thank you very much. I told you it was going to go fast, Bill. I, I appreciate the uh, the passion. You could see it in how you talk about your old yeah. man. You could see it in how you talk about, you know, people that you work with. That's that's the most import, important part. You cannot fake that. So no. that's – I, uh, I, su I can tough. sum it up. I can sum it up in one word, blessed. Yeah. I am blessed. No, yeah. we all, all of us, absolutely, man. I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm blessed to have worked with so many amazing, you know, firefighters, and uh, and I still, even in retirement, you got the parties, you got the phone calls. Um, there is life after, you know, when you retire. It don't suck. Uh, no. It does, oh, there you go. That's right. <laughs> it don't it suck. Doesn't suck. <laughs> it doesn't suck. And like I said, we got the memories and we got our friends. Solid, Amen, bro. Cheers, bros. Nice work. Yes. All right, bro, All stay stuff. on. Don't hang up. What do we got on uh, Monday? Do we got something? Monday, I'm working on a few things. I got to see oh, what I have. So I want to thank Tilly for coming on uh, the other day. Uh, she did a great job. got her book. It's on Amazon. Uh, she was great, and she got really good feedback. A lot of people uh, enjoyed the show. Oh, my goodness. And uh, I think I spoke hey, just a her reminder, about her 100, book 100 books already. She doesn't. Uh, she doesn't collect a penny off those books, guys. Um, and in her own words, she doesn't want to make money off of her father's death, and all of it goes to uh, the widows um, and children of uh, fallen first responders. So please, um, if you guys are interested in the story, uh, definitely. Yeah, uh, check out check out uh, that uh, that show. That was so a great 9 11 show. Nine eleven through yeah. the eyes of a daughter on on Amazon. Nine eleven through the eyes also, of a daughter. Also, there is you know, but. By, by her writing the book like that and things, if you keep uh, one's memory alive, you keep them alive. Yeah, and you, no doubt. Well, you by, did a great job tonight, fella. With your old man, no doubt. No, it was good. I enjoyed know, but, uh, it. She, she did a great job writing the book about her, her dad. Yeah. And, uh, Bless you. you know. All right, Petey, uh, also, we'll put it out. Uh, there is no show next Thursday. Coobs has a wedding. What? What? Yep. In the pandemic, wedding word. And Ruffy's out looking at some kind of uh, uh, deer shooting, animal killing land somewhere. I don't know what he's doing. My word. <laughs> Something like that. So Friday, my man Ruffy came up with a dynamite idea for a show. 
Hmm. It's like the Seinfeld. We took it from him. It's called The Show About Nothing. Nothing. We're gonna sit here. <laughs> it's going to be nothing. Well, what are you going to talk about tonight? We're, Absolutely nothing. We're going to sit here. Five, maybe we'll do a extended five minutes of Fury. Maybe we'll actually talk to you guys in the chat. But it's basically a show about nothing. Whatever you want to bring up. So yep. I like gonna, it. We're getting hammer drunk on oh, right. wine and hot dogs. Right. That's the only thing you got to bring is because we're going to hammer it and get silly drunk stupid. Uh -huh. so that's Friday's oh. show. Again, Billy, thanks. Uh, send us your size, right, Ruffy? You have his address? Yeah, I'll talk to him after the, after the show about that. Oh, that's in the pro show. Right, yeah. sorry. Mixed up. <laughs> All right. I thought we were in there. Yeah. All right. All right, stay low and go. All right, have a good night. We'll see you at the big one. All right. Good night. Cheers, brothers.